Well, good morning. Thank you all for coming together for this joint informational hearing uh, on this, with the Senate Select Committee on California's Wine Industry and the Assembly Select Committee on Wine as well. Uh, we are grateful that all of you have gathered here today. Uh, we have the chairwoman uh, from the Assembly Select Committee on Wine. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman, for being here. Uh, Assemblywoman Aguiar Curry and Senator Bill Dodd, who is the co-chair and a uh, great partner, I got to say, uh, and grateful for all of his work uh, with the Senate Select Committee on California's Wine Industry. We're grateful that Assemblywoman Lamone is here representing uh, the great county of Santa Barbara and beyond, along with uh, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson as well. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we couldn't be more excited uh, to be on this gorgeous campus and in one of North America's premier wine regions. I want to say thank you to the partnership of UCSB, who has been uh, fantastic to work with as we've been moving forward on this hearing, and a special thank you to Senator Jackson and Assemblywoman Lamone uh, for their hospitality as well. Thank you so much. Wine is now grown in 48 of 58 counties here in California, San Diego in the south to Trinity County in the north. And these two select committees are dedicated to having more of a presence uh, in each of the producing counties. Uh, and we are committed to the success of the Golden State's now $200 billion wine industry. Uh, today's hearing, I got to say, and I think I could speak for Senator Dodd and Assemblyman Aguiar Curry, today's hearing is bittersweet. Uh, while we are grateful to be on the Central Coast, I think we can be honest and say that our hearts remain in Sonoma, Napa, Lake, and Mendocino counties. The devastating North Bay firestorm, now the most destructive and deadly in our nation's history, uh, has destroyed over 7,000 homes, devastated hundreds of businesses, and greatly impacted the North Coast wine industry. That said, what we know about this industry and the North Coast itself, it's bold, resilient, and it will be coming back stronger than ever. So today's hearing uh, will be focused on two different subject areas. Number one, fires and recovery, uh, and how the fires have impacted the industry and how this industry is going to be coming back stronger than ever. Similarly, when Aguiar Curry will be leading our panel on fires and recovery, and then we're going to turn it over to Senator Bill Dodd, who will be focused on pest disease and vector management in the California wine industry. But before we get into our panels, we'd like to again welcome uh, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, Assemblywoman Monique Lamone, uh, here to the panel. Uh, how grateful we are again for all of your hospitality to be able to offer welcoming remarks. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, three weeks ago, I was up in your neck of the woods looking at the damage uh, associated with those horrific fires. And uh, I know. Uh, representing an area such as this, uh, Assemblywoman Limon and I extend our heartfelt uh, concerns and sympathies. We've had, not quite to the extent that you have, but we've certainly had our share of fires here and know how devastating and impactful they are. And uh, I know that the people of this, uh, the 19th Senate District and the 37th Assembly District uh, extend our condolences and our uh, hopes and, and uh, wishes that we can uh, also be helpful to you uh, in the process of uh, healing, recovery, and learning from uh, the devastation of these fires. But foremost, I want to welcome you to God's country. Uh, I say very humbly, but of course here we are at one of the most beautiful campuses I know of where we get to look out at the mountains and we are right at the ocean. Uh, the good people of UCSB, I want to thank them for extending their hospitality as well and look forward to a, a wonderful uh, and informative hearing with these panelists and thank them for being here as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's also election day here uh, in it Santa is. Barbara as well. It is. It is election day for the city of Santa Barbara. So again, thank you, colleagues, uh, for for visiting us. And I think uh, it's you know when we think of California, we think of how much we have in common um, in terms of different regions. And so uh, to hear what's happening, what's happened um, in North County and Sonoma, Napa counties, um, we also think about how we here in Santa Barbara County are a sister. And so when our family is in trouble, we also feel the pain. So our heart um, goes out. But more than that, I think that today's conversation is about driving um, ideas and policies in terms of what it is we can do 
um, for our respective counties that share uh, similarities, particularly around the wine industry. I know that we have over 200 wineries here in Santa Barbara County. Six of those are recognized as American uh, viticultural areas. And so I think that it's important to uh, have those conversations. And I'm very thankful that you've brought this conversation to a region um, that uh, is also uh, very familiar with fires and uh, lives with the threat of what it can do to our economy and our community in the ways that um, you have all regrettably experienced. So thank you uh, for the conversation. And I look forward to uh, being part of some of the ideas uh, and thoughts that come out of this. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. And again, thank you so much for welcoming us and for all of your work as well, working with our teams to make sure that this uh, hearing is smooth and goes off without a hitch. And we're grateful for your work. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to be able to turn it over to the co-chair of the Senate Select Committee on California's Wine Industry, and that's Senator Bill, jo Bill Dodd. I gotta say, Senator Dodd has been working overtime along with the Assemblywoman to be able to deliver services and programs to all those who have been impacted by the fires. It's been an absolute honor to be able to work with both of you. Thank you to you and to your teams for your work on this hearing as well. Turn it over to our co-chair, Mr. Dodd. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and right back at you uh, for you and your team for organizing this event. I do want to thank UCSB for allowing us to be here today. That was one of the, uh, you know, I, I was the, the, the chair of this committee, select committee when I was in this state assembly. Proud to be able to co-serve with uh, Senator McGuire here. But uh, I think the three of us talked about uh, doing something different. Normally our hearings are pretty Napa and Sonoma centric because that's where we live. And one of the goals that we had this year when we took on uh, the, the, the Senate and the Assembly uh, committees, because we do things together, uh, unlike other areas of the legislature, because I think it's important to have a unified front, is we wanted to, to take this, these hearings on the road to other great wine growing regions uh, that are really doing a great job and exemplify uh, the great wine regions of the state of California. So you'll be seeing more of that. We're going to be out and about in other areas uh, you know, of the state. So we're pleased to be here in Santa Barbara today. I'm not going to uh, continue to go on. Mike covered so much that uh, I totally agree with. And I just appreciate uh, those of you and the panels that are here today helping us out, getting good information out to our public and to the capital area. Thank you so much, Senator Dodd. And again, thank you for all of your work, sir. It is now a pleasure to be able to turn this hearing over to Assemblywoman Cecilia Aguiar-Curry, who will be offering a welcoming note, uh, and then she'll be running our first panel. Assemblywoman, thank you for all your work, particularly in these last four weeks. It's been a hell of a four weeks uh, for <laughs> Napa and Sonoma and Lake and Mendocino, and grateful for your leadership, uh, and I'll turn the hearing over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Senator McGuire, and Senator Dodd, thank you. Um, we have become fast friends. Uh, we were before the fires, but we pretty much can tell anything what's happened to us in the past month. Uh, we've spent a lot of time together collaborating, but we didn't do it on our own. And so, first of all, I'd like to shout out to the governor as well as to um, the uh, Senate pro tem as well as our speaker that they were really behind us all the way. Um, if we didn't have the collaboration and the hard work, we would not be where we are today, moving fast forward and trying to rebuild, as we call Rebuild North Bay. So um, I'm hoping that today that we'll all have a lesson that we'll learn, that you may learn. We've learned a lot of lessons along our way. And the wine industry is so uh, instrumental for the agricultural communities that particularly all of us represent. I represent the 4th District, and I have Lake County, Sonoma County, parts of Sonoma County, Napa County, Calusa County, uh, Yolo County, as well as, I'm missing one, Sonoma. And four of my uh, territories, my uh, counties, were up in flames, and they did affect not only households, but it did affect the wine community. So um, I'd like to just shout out to, set to, to remind everybody we're still working hard, and that we're hoping that we can move quickly enough so that we can bring back tourism back to our areas, as well as uh, help replenish the, the losses that some of our agricultural community has, uh, in taken, has taken. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our panel today. We have um, first Kim Zagarias from the State Fire and Rescue Chief of the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Welcome. We have Margie Lindquist from the District Conservatism of the, I can't even say that, of the Natural Resources Conservation Service from the United States Department of Agriculture. We have Tim Schmitzer from the Vice President of the California State Relations for Wine Inst Institute. 
And we have Michael Miller, California Association for Wine Grape Growers. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, I'd like to go ahead and start it off with Kim, and um, I appreciate you spending the time with us. We've all learned a lot in the past couple of weeks. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> on behalf of the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, my director, Mark Gellarducci, um, we're glad to participate in today's event. I also Again, on behalf of the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services and Director Mark Gelarducci, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to speak with you today. Um, I need to first start off with uh, uh, my wife had suggested that I remind, remind, reminded me that uh, uh, she's a big wine connoisseur. She loves her wine. Uh, I've learned a couple things in the time I've been married. One, I buy her wine by the case and her dark, ch and her dark chocolate by the case. Happy <laughs> wife, happy life. And I think she has not less than 200 bottles uh, at the house. I try to get her to get it down, but she continues to go out and, and bring more home. <laughs> so um, the, last, uh, the last month has been a, a difficult time, I think, for all Californians. And I think that uh, it's affected a lot of folks in a lot of different ways. Let me start out with uh, giving you some statistics. So. Uh, within the state of California this year, we've had some 8,442 fires, uh, burnt well over a million acres within the state. That's uh, uh, state and federal lands that uh, we've tracked uh, through CAL FIRE. Um, probably you've already heard this, but uh, of the state responsible area, about half a million acres is burnt. And of that, uh, 245,000 acres were burnt just in the last uh, fire siege in, in the north part of the state. And that's a, that's a, lot, of, uh, it's a lot of land to go up. Um, probably more disturbing is in, on the night of the 8th when fire started uh, with the wind, uh, things went very quickly. Uh, and very shortly, we had about 21 fires going. Uh, before it was all over, required 11,000 firefighters, over 100,000 folks were evacuated. And currently, and these are approximate numbers, about 8,900 structures have been destroyed uh, residential and commercial. Uh, 43 lives have been lost. There are still uh, a number of missing. Um, we had some 92,000 outages uh, and just power, 42,000 uh, 40, gas outages. We had over 42 cellular sites that went down during the course of the emergency. And I think that um, uh, one of the things that we are going to need to address within the state is more resiliency in our, our desire to have uh, internet capability as well as our cellular. We've become very reliant upon it. And I would tell you that uh, Director Gallarducci has already talked that um, there, are, there are some things we can't do within the state because some of what goes on in the comms industry is controlled by the FCC. And we're going to need to work with our federal partners to strengthen up the resiliency uh, that we have in that one particular side of the house. Uh, we had uh, seven water systems go down during the emergency. Uh, if you lose power, you lose water. If you lose other parts of the, of the water grid, it uh, creates additional is issues. We had uh, two 911 outages out of, out of this. Um, you look at the response, both the local, state, federal, and I'll tell you the tribal as well, but a, 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 very, a very resilient citizen-based response as well. Um, we have saw things that uh, I have not seen in a number of years. And if, if you notice on my bio, I've got 40 years of doing this. The last 30 with the state, the last 16 as a fire chief with Cal OES. So there hasn't been a major emergency. Fire, floods, earthquakes, terrorism events someplace either in the state or in the country I have not been involved in. Um, very destructive. Required some uh, assistance from 19 other states that responded to assist California. Uh, outside the state, as well as we brought in Australia to assist us as well. Um, the number of uh, issues that are going to impact us uh, will be significant. I think uh, those of you who, who watched and, and, and looked at the response definitely saw a number of key agencies, such as Cal OES, CAL FIRE, CHP, the California National Guard providing resources, just some of the many state families. And as I think most of you are well aware, when you look at the response that we're currently dealing with uh, within the state system currently right now, uh, there's almost no state agency that's not involved in some way, fashion, or form. 
And whether you're not directly involved as a responsible state agency, they're supplying people and resources to assist uh, in the recovery efforts that we have out there. Uh, when you look at the, the law enforcement side alone, our law enforcement moved uh, over 4,262 law enforcement personnel mutual aid to assist uh, in the areas that were impacted in those northern counties, as well as Orange County, who was impacted as well uh, during the same time. I would tell you, as managing the state's fire and rescue resources, we moved some 613 OES and local government resources, and, and they really are the draw that we utilize each and every day for both initial attack as well as surge capacity within the state of California. On, uh, on uh, Monday, we had resources coming out of Southern California that were diverted uh, back to, to, to stay within Orange County to assist them with their fire there. When I look at the overall response within California, and I think Senator Jackson will tell you that she's heard from me several times, while we have probably the most ro robust mutual aid system for fire and law and first responders anywhere in the country, we are struggling within this state to make things work. And I, I will tell you that wholeheartedly. Um, this go around, uh, I, through the uh, Emergency Management Assistance Compact, moved in some 213 engines from out of state, on top of what CAL FIRE requested additional from the U.S. Forest Service and Department of the Interior and their resources that came in as well. But uh, very robust capabilities that are out there. I think as you look at things, um, the California National Guard, <clears throat> and we're lucky to have a very robust uh, uh, National Guard out there, they supplied, we, they supplied us with 13 helicopters. Uh, two of those came from the state of Nevada to assist uh, us, uh, 13 helicopters. Um, we brought in the two uh, MAF units that are used as air tankers out of Channel Islands. Uh, we brought in an RC-26 for reconnaissance, as well as an MQ-9 uh, as well to help with mapping, as well as uh, look at the infrastructure and the houses that were destroyed. Uh, and that RC-26 and the MQ-9, as Director Geladucci would tell you, actually uh, facilitated and assisted us to moving forward and getting a presidential declaration much quicker than we've ever had in the past. And I think that those of you who have been involved, and I, and I, I know that uh, several of you have been sitting in several of the meetings with Director Galaducci, him and uh, Bob Fenton from uh, FEMA have been moving at light speed to get things done. Uh, I sit every morning at 7.30 with the director and most of our senior staff uh, on a phone call just to the agency wide, and then we do a, a unified coordinating group with the other state and federal agencies that are involved to make sure we keep things moving along. And I can tell you that um, in, in, my, in my 40 years, in the last 30 with the state, and I've been all over this country, uh, I've never seen anything move quite as fast as we are currently as a state and federal, our federal partners are working together right now with our local partners. It is really amazing uh, in, in where I see things uh, today and, and how things are moving along. Um, I want you to keep in mind that um, as we keep statistics, and that's all they are because it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting state to work in. You look at almost 40 million population covering 168,000 square miles of some of the most diverse culture and geography you'll meet anywhere in the world. Um, the Tubbs fire in uh, Sonoma is now ranked as the, as the third most deadliest fire in California's history. The Redwood fire in <coughs> Mendocino is number 10. The Atlas Fire in uh, Napa and some of Sonoma is, is number 13, and the Cascade Fire in Yuba ends up being number 19. The most destructive fire, unfortunately, the Tubbs is taking number one on that list, followed by the Nuns Fire, the Atlas Fire, and then the Redwood Fire. <clears throat> I'm not sure that anybody <clears throat> has been left behind and, and part of this, and you know, you read the you read the media, we'll talk to local elected officials, and like most things, you see that Napa and, and Sonoma are getting the lion's share of the press. That may be the press, but they're getting not all the lion's share of the resources or the support that goes into what it takes to respond to this uh, disaster and the recovery that's going to need to take place. I think as we, as we were talking before, the, um, uh, before we started the uh, hearing, uh, we have 13 wineries that have been impacted, nine destroyed. And when I say destroyed, um, most of those are the buildings, the contents, some damage to uh, some of the, uh, the fields, which will take much longer to recover than it will to, re to rebuild those uh, facilities, three that are damaged. It's going to take a, a strong effort, but um, 
and one reality is a lot of our agricultural holdings, much like it is down here, um, some of that actually slows our fires down. It acts as somewhat of a fire break. And what ends up happening is the perimeter of those fields take a brunt of the heat, take a lot of, take some of the damage, but a lot of the inner, uh, inner uh, part of those uh, uh, fields don't get as much damage. Um, so I think his, I would, I would leave you with the thought is that while well, there's a lot of, a lot of destruction, there's been death and, and the sadness that goes with that, the recovery that's going to take place. From where I look at things, um, from an agriculture standpoint, things are still open, they're still very robust, and we still have a lot to provide uh, out there. I think what we probably need more than anything is to get, uh, to get uh, people settled, get the hotels, get the industry back in line, and get people once again visiting our, our great state and visiting those areas to uh, keep those businesses in the agricultural industry up and running as well, and the industry goes with it. Thank you very much, Chief. I think what we'll do is we'll wait for the uh, uh, questions at the end of the panel so that we make sure we get those. So if you want to start writing those down and if you want to, we can collect some of those from the audience as well. I guess we could actually just take hands at that point. So thank you very much. Um, I know that the information is so, uh, a plethora of information is there. Um, and please make sure you tap into the Chief afterwards because um, there's a lot of stories that we can uh, tell and I don't know that we'll have the entire afternoon to do so, so thank you. Okay, welcome, Margie, nice to meet you, and um, if you could give us a little bit of update on with the Department of Agriculture. Okay, good morning, I'm Margie Lindquist, and I am with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. We are part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and um, the county I work in is San Luis Obispo County, just up the road a little ways, and so I am here to update you on, on what NRCS has been doing as a result of our wildfire season. Um, as a result of the Northern California wildfires, uh, NRCS has been involved in uh, partnering with other federal and state agencies uh, to provide technical assistance. That is really our main function. Uh, we provide technical assistance to landowners, to private landowners, on a case-by-case, site-by-site, um, basis and so we are well positioned after disasters including wildfires uh, to get out and to visit with with our, our landowners who've been impacted and after a fire of course what we're really concerned with is um, getting ready for the winter so getting out and looking at the site hearing the concerns of our property owner uh, and and what we see as concerns as well and coming up with recommendations for folks that they can implement before the onset of the rainy season to help protect their property to protect life so um, that is our main function uh, in, in general we are working uh, very cooperatively with the other agencies uh, there's a statewide uh, Sacramento watershed clearinghouse that's been set up by FEMA and our agency is a part of that uh, we have a full-time NRCS specialist who is um, part of staffing a joint field operations center in Sacramento, and that is uh, kind of a place for, for folks to come, hear what, you know, NRCS, FEMA, uh, Army Corps, whatever agency might, might potentially be involved in their particular uh, property, what concerns them, uh, to come and get kind of a one-stop, um, you know, help as to, to what assistance might be available to them. Uh, we have uh, participated in numerous workshops uh, put on by the, the grower groups. Um, uh, wherever we're invited to come and talk and share what we can offer folks, we show up and, and we are sh sure to be there. So to get the word out that we're available and that we have um, a pretty well-rounded staff available uh, and we can draw staff from other uh, areas of the state as we need, um, but conservation planners, soil scientists, engineers, uh, range management specialists, uh, whatever the need might be, we in times uh, of need can draw these folks in from, from other places around the state. Um, I would like to show you our website that our public affairs folks have put together.
our public affairs uh, folks up in the, the state office in Davis have put together this post-fire disaster assistance uh, website, and it has a lot of very useful information. Uh, the part I'd like to show you The publications portion of this website is very useful. Um, so you'll see there that we have um, these, these series of fact sheets. And so they have been customized to the different counties uh, that we, we have uh, a real need for these right now. So these are very practical in nature for landowners uh, to help them with uh, hydro mulching. What is it? Where do I use it? How do I, how do I implement it? Um, straw bale barriers, log uh, barriers, things that help a landowner uh, deal with uh, runoff and debris flows and that, things of that nature that they need to be concerned with with the upcoming winter. Probably our, our biggest, um, I think what we can offer uh, that is of most value, and I've already touched on it, is our, um, our technical assistance and our folks in our offices. And there is an NRCS presence in every county across the state, across the nation. So you are able to contact our folks uh, directly. The first, the first slide. Yeah, here um, we have the contacts for our uh, most impacted counties uh, here. Um, and we would encourage people to call these folks. These are the district conservationists in those offices and come, you know, set up an appointment. Have, have a planner, have an engineer come out to your, your property and, and do a site assessment, get some recommendations, and that's the best place for us to, to start in the way we can be most effective um, after fires and other disasters. Um, these are those, those affected counties, but you can also access our other counties. Oops, let me go back up. Did I? There. Uh, here, uh, that is a link to, to any county that, that you might need assistance uh, in. And um, when the need uh, situation arises where we can see there is a need for a little more uh, technical expertise out there when we go out to visit with folks where maybe there's a group of landowners affected, um, there might be some water supply <coughs> uh, reservoirs impacted as there were in Napa and some of these counties, we can send out a team of specialists to actually assess what the impacts might be um, this winter. Uh, for damage and and actually produce a report for, uh, as a result of that with some recommendations in it. So um, as our planners go out and as our teams go out and work with folks out there in the impacted areas, uh, they may also um, be eligible for some financial assistance. So we have um, a couple of different programs, uh, the main one being our Environmental Quality <coughs> Incentives Program. And that is uh, this fact sheet that was, I think, passed out to you. Yeah. So there has been some um, special funding set aside in our catastrophic wildfire fund pool for 2018. <coughs> and starting with $4 million, it's available to help folks um, deal with post-fire impacts to their properties. And the things we would be looking at helping with through that program would be really stabilizing soil, um, revegetation, uh, diversion <coughs> work, grade stabilization structures, things of that nature that will help people get through the winter. Access roads are huge on any operation. And so after a fire, they're particularly, particularly vulnerable and uh, sources of sediment. So things of that nature can be addressed through this program. So people have um, an opportunity to get in and to apply for those funds to get our folks out there and um, you know, see what we might be, how we might be able to help them with this program. It is a farm bill program. It's for agricultural <laughs> producers, uh, whether they be uh, grape growers or 
or range management, whatever, you know, whatever operations they have, we can help with. Mm -hmm. um, another program that I'd like to mention is um, the Emergency Watershed Protection Program. And this one, I have, uh, there's also a handout for this. And this is um, not to help individual landowners. Uh, this is uh, to more to be used on a watershed basis. So uh, these are for larger projects where we can go in and help communities, help you know, on a watershed scale to help prepare for, for winter rains and winter runoff. And we need a project sponsor under this program, and that would be some subdivision of the state, like a city, uh, a county, uh, resource conservation district, something of that nature, who steps forward to be um, a project sponsor. So um, last thing I'd like to, uh, to talk about a little bit is um, the fact that we USDA agencies who work with the agricultural folks, um, we are all found in service centers across everywhere you go. You should find a service center someplace in a county. And we are there with our sister agencies, uh, the Farm Service Agency, Rural Development, um, and that is a good place to start for anyone who has um, any kind of damage or loss <clears throat> as a result of wildfire or any other disaster is to call in and um, report your damage, report your losses, and get, get into the system and um, you know, let us start with you that way. So we would love for folks to know we're out here, uh, that we're ready to help, and encourage them to, to call us. Time is of the essence because winter is fast approaching. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I have to um, remind myself is that when we had fires up in uh, Lake County and other places in the past couple of years, we forget about after the fire what happens and what it does to the environment and so on and so forth. So thank you very much. And I have a couple of questions for you later on, okay. so thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Oh, I guess it's morning, Tim. How are you? Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome, and let's share what's going on with the Wine Institute and where we're standing right now with after yeah, the Yeah, happy to. So, uh, so Tim Schmelzer, I'm uh, Vice President, California State Relations for Wine Institute. And uh, Wine Institute, is this coming through? It seems like not as loud as that, Mike. Yeah. Good? Okay. Uh, wine Institute um, is uh, essentially a trade uh, association for California wineries. Uh, we have about a thousand uh, members throughout the state of California. And, uh, you know, as a result, care and say incredibly deeply about what's happened here. Also, wanted to take uh, this opportunity to express uh, our uh, sincere thanks for all the great efforts of, you know, both you folks. And um, I recently uh, personally went up and visited the fire areas over the weekend. and. It is just amazing the work they did to protect structures up there. I was just flabbergasted. I mean, I read about it, uh, all, all this, but boy, when you see how close the fires got to structures that were saved, it is just flabbergasting. So I uh, really want to express our gratitude. That was amazing work, and the fact, uh, you know, this recognition of the work that needs to go on going forward, too, is really appreciated because, you know, it'll be a while, uh, especially. Uh, those that were unfortunate enough to have lost vineyards, that's a several year recovery process, no matter what. So anyway, I wanted to mention that briefly. Um, so it's been interesting for, um, does the clicker work by the way? Okay, uh, next. <laughs> yeah. So it's been interesting for uh, Wine Institute to kind of figure out what our, what our role uh, was gonna be here in, a, in this disaster. Uh, you know, we quickly learned that the regional wine associations were really best equipped uh, and because they're, they're on the ground to deal with kind of the on the ground needs of, of um, our membership and it uh, kind of became the role of Wine Institute uh, to kind of communicate to the world and to put this in context which if you think about it, it was kind of awkward for us a, a little bit because we're both uh, you know having to take care of our members that were impacted by this uh, but we also have to create context you know the California wine industry is still here for example. Um, I think we actually have some, some better numbers than, than I have here now, but um, while there was a number of wineries impacted, um, I don't know if that number is um, 11 or 20 or whatever, it's, uh, you know, any one is too many, but for context, there's 1,200 wineries in the affected counties there. So devastating impacts, but honestly, we feel lucky that the damage wasn't more widespread. Uh, in the context of California, we have 4,700 wineries in California. So 
again, terrible news that any of them were impacted, but we're talking 20 of, of you know, well over 4,000 wineries in the state. And uh, just like anecdotally for me, and I'm sure this has happened to all you as well, um, if you've run into people, um, maybe even just outside of Northern California, but certainly outside of California, reading about the fires, I mean, people thought the entire California wine industry was gone. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. did. And, uh, and that's, <laughs> we quickly realized that's gonna be a big problem if we don't get the word out. Um, so uh, that's one of the ma major things we've done. So next slide here. Uh, uh, I mentioned briefly already, uh, one of the reasons we got, you know, like I said, lucky as, as we did, is the vineyards acted as a tremendous firebreak for, for uh, the firefighters in protecting structures. And uh, you know, we, all, we almost smugly wanna go, well, God, we need more vineyards out there than I guess. But uh, we were really pleased with the fact that, uh, that uh, these vineyards did, did protect so many structures. So if you were uh, surrounded or adjacent to vineyards, there's a very good chance those, those vineyards might've, might've saved your property. Uh, so we're obviously very proud of that fact. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, context uh, just for the California wine industry in general. Uh, we were just talking about this this earlier, but um, of all the uh, wine grapes uh, grown in, throughout the United States, 85% of them uh, come from California. Uh, in the world context, California is the fourth leading wine producer in the entire world. Uh, just within the state of California, uh, we create well over 300,000 jobs. And again, specific to California, I know uh, Senator McGuire mentioned, I think the nationwide uh, figure uh, but to the state of California, our industry uh, contributes uh, over $57 billion of economic activity. So uh, we like to consider ourselves pretty important, yeah. <laughs> I guess is my point. And, uh, and this message that the California wine industry is moving forward and open for business is critical in making sure that this economic engine for California uh, continues to move forward. So next slide, please. So, um, you know, we, again, I think we've talked about some of these numbers, but uh, the uh, wine grapes grown in the three regions uh, that were impacted by the fires we're talking about today constitute about 12% of the wine grapes uh, that are grown in California. And uh, Napa, I think, has a deservedly outsized reputation. They make fantastic wines there, but uh, most of the world tends to think that that's the entirety of the California what was uh, that wine industry. You used? <laughs> <coughs> What's that? I did say nice things. Come on. Uh, but anyway, but the, the point here is that <laughs> just remember yes, where you are, yeah. We have we have great and productive wine regions all, all throughout uh, the state of California. I, th I think uh, mo most people don't realize, I think it's over 60% of wine grapes in California actually come from the Central Valley. But of course, uh, the Central Coast makes a huge contribution uh, to the wine industry as well. So <laughs> we're still here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, really good. Yeah, <laughs> so delicious, oh my God. Um, anyway, so um, one, one bit of, uh, you know, again, trying to find good news out of bad news here. Uh, when the fires did hit, um, the good news for the Im impacted industry is that about 90% of the harvest in, in most areas was okay. already in. And that's hugely important because um, one, just access to your grapes became very difficult. And of course, uh, while the grapes still hanging and there's smoke in the air, uh, you know, smoke tank does potentially become a concern. So to have that fruit already into the wineries and, and being produced into wine um, was, we caught a, a huge break there. And uh, because of that fact, and we absolutely fully expect 2017 to be a fantastic vintage. So um, this isn't like we lost a harvest here. Uh, and that's an important message that uh, we need to get out there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the economic impact uh, specifically to our wine industry, just frankly, we haven't been able to wrap our, our arms around it. Um, we're, we're starting to get an idea of the impact on on uh, other residential and commercial structures. And, and certainly it's, it's the loss of the, the homes, I think, that's the, really the big story uh, in this fire to us. Um, you know, these are our neighbors and our employees who lost homes. I, I know many people personally that were dramatically impacted by the fire. I can't imagine you as being from the districts, how many you know. And uh, you know, rebuilding and, and um, you know, wineries being able to uh, continue to have enough employees with all this insane loss of uh, housing is going to be a real challenge going forward. I and mean, we've already experiencing yeah. labor shortages uh, throughout the industry, and, and this certainly isn't helpful. So 
uh, you know, rebuilding and, and trying to get people to stay in the area and, and work in those great jobs is, is uh, in a way, you know, the biggest immediate impact to the industry. So I wanted to point that out as well. Uh, next slide. So again, I said if I, if I didn't say that California wine is open for business 10 times, I probably wasn't doing a good job today. Uh, but I just want to stress the, the impact uh, that it has if, if tourism goes away in these areas. It's devastating. That's, that's the lifeblood of these areas. Uh, and they are open. You can go into Sonoma County, Napa County, Mendocino County, taste rooms are open and ready for your, for your business. Um, and you should go <laughs> patronize these wineries. <laughs> they, they need your help right now. And the best way to help them is to, to patronize them. Uh, we've been working with uh, Visit Cal next slide, please. Uh, with Visit California has been a okay. great partner of, of Wine Institute and, and you know the state and the industry for many years, uh, and developing uh, responses to this, getting information out uh, that's that's real. And you know you've all probably seen there's uh, poor William Hill Estate had there was a picture of a burnt sign. It made it look like their winery was gone. Right, they lost their front lawn. I think is what happened. Right. <laughs> So uh, they've been a really important partner for us to get good information out there. Uh, so they've got this uh, hashtag California Wine Country now, uh, which the key is just to make sure people understand that uh, you know the, the wine business is indeed open for business and and to get out there. And uh, we appreciate the efforts uh, they've they've been making to get that information out there. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so we've had to develop a uh, you know, comprehensive uh, media strategy and communication strategy to make sure that, that people understand uh, that we're open for business. <laughs> and, uh, cool. and uh, you know, we f first started with just uh, being very reactive to, uh, you know, monitoring the media, trying to correct stories to get uh, reporters out there to see what's real uh, versus uh, some of the uh, almost fake news that was out there about some of this impact. Uh, get social media activated, just, you know, get, get words out there. Uh, then we kind of focus more to recovery, uh, community forums to make sure good information is getting out to the industry. Uh, we have a great benefit uh, dinner called Grateful Table. It's coming up. I think that's going to be in Sonoma November 21st. Yeah. Oh. Um, that's uh, going to be a great fundraiser. Uh, I don't have a slide for it. I should, but I, I guess there's going to be a, a pretty big fundraiser. It's going to be at AT&T Park, headlined by Metallica, apparently. So. <laughs> Hot damn! <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it's it, the outpouring of support for the industry and in the in these fundraisers uh, mean a lot, and, and people need the help. So, uh, so it's been great to see that. Um, and I think that's about what I have for you all. Uh, I did want to mention just because we talked about uh, sentiment a little bit. Um, so my office mainly is responsible for dealing with um, legislative and regulatory affairs, and we found one of uh, the main roles that, that we can play to help out our impacted members right now is uh, reaching out to the regulatory agencies who are expecting reporting and, and you know reports to get in, some monitoring to be done, and some of these vineyards were dramatically impacted by these fires in a way that's going to make you know their sedimentation numbers off the chart for what they otherwise would be, and we don't want to find them in some yeah. regulatory penalty box uh, because of these fires. And uh, while these meetings are, are preliminary right now, um, they've been what I consider pretty responsive. And um, I think we're going to be able to push back some of those regulatory deadlines in order to assist with the recovery and not unduly burden folks. Uh, so I wanted to mention that's a big part of this effort as well. Uh, also, I think California uh, ABC should be mentioned. They've been really helpful in, in making sure the um, tasting rooms uh, had all the you know, regulatory cover they needed to open back up. Those that needed to, to move uh, you know, were able to take their license with them so they could continue to do business as well. So I wanted to give a shout out there for what it's worth. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you very much, Tim. And um, I appreciate you bringing up one of the issues that, the regulatory issues that could come down the pike. So thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. I'm sure we'll have some questions on that in a minute. Hello, Mr. Miller, welcome. Um, good morning and, just on. Good morning and uh, thank you very much for holding this important hearing. Um, my name is Michael Miller. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the California Association of Wine and Grape Growers. Uh, we represent the growers in California, so I'm going to talk about things. Can you hear me? Is it better? Okay. Uh, we represent the uh, wine and grape growers in California, so I'm going to talk about how the fires have affected them directly and what it's meant to growers to have to deal with the effects of these fires. I'll try not to duplicate a lot of the information that you've heard earlier. Um, first, I have to say I'm just our hearts go out to all the victims of the fires. I've toured the area. Um, the devastation is incredible. Um, 
we all know too many growers, ag workers, community members who've lost their homes. Um, I can't say, you know, I'm sorry I'm for them. It's a devastating situation. Also want to say thank you to the first responders. Um, when I was in, um, in Sonoma, Napa last week, I talked to a lot of first responders. The work you guys did was amazing. Um, and thank you does not begin to cover the gratitude you deserve. Um, while we don't know the full, the full effect of the fires just yet, what we do know is that it was devastating and that it will take quite some time to rebuild. That said, we are sure that the wine industry is strong, it's resilient. We have every faith in the quality of the grapes we grow. They're the best in the world. And the wine we make, which is second to none. Um, we all know without a doubt that 2017 wines will be of the highest quality vintage. As Tim pointed out, wine country is open for business. Please come by. Um, Napa and Sonoma counties alone have more than 100,000 vineyard acres. The grapes in those counties are worth $1.3 billion. The biggest challenge during the first day or so of the fires was the immediate need to get away. As growers called to report nearby fires, they were told to leave as there would be no immediate aid coming. Um, there were, the first responders were spread just too thin. They were beyond capacity. The fires moved so quickly and across wide ranges of areas that there were no resources available to fight the fires. As a result, many growers lost machinery and outbuildings immediately um, simply because there was no time to react. The swiftness of the fires, the volume of the fires meant that the only thing people could do was just to get away. In the next day or so, growers quickly realized that the historic wildfires would not be contained for quite a while. Fortunately, the grapes were already 75% to 90% harvested, as Tim pointed out, depending on the location. Um, that included nearly all the white grapes and most of the reds. However, the remaining grapes were late ripening reds, like Cabernet Sauvignon, which were ready to be mm -hmm. harvested. Consequently, growers needed to act quickly. Uh, workers and growers needed access to vineyards, or the grapes would remain on the vines unpicked. Uh, this would mean a substantial loss of wages and a loss of crop. The potential on the industry at that point could have been significant. While the counties affected most by the fires accounted for only 12.5% of California's wine grape production in tons, they account for 41% of California's wine grape value in dollars. The grapes that were still on the vines were the most expensive of California's wine grapes. Tim, love Napa wines. <laughs> In the first few days of the fires, COG heard from several growers who were having difficulty getting access to vineyards. So COG contacted local wine grape groups, OES, county ag commissioners to identify needs for access and to help put together a system that allowed safe and quick access. Each of the groups of the first responders stepped up and helped provide access quickly. Sonoma Wine Grape Commission, Napa Valley uh, Grape Growers, Mendocino Wine Grape Growers, Farm bureaus and others all came together to address the problem in a quick and timely fashion. This cooperative and concerted effort helped save the wages of hundreds of workers and thousands of tons of valuable and high quality wine grapes. We believe this successful effort was for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, the wines themselves, the vines, were not on fire. In many cases, as was pointed out, the vineyard served as a fire break. There was minimal or no smoke um, damage on the wines and the Fires were of no threat to the vines or to the harvesting activities. Secondly, growers were able to quickly identify the highest priorities and were able to get access to harvest. First responders were dealing with road closures for a variety of public safety concerns and growers were able to work with those challenges in a careful and efficient manner. Post fire, the challenges to growers are incredible. The first thing is to make sure that everyone is safe and that, that people are accounted for. Many of the families who are most in need worked in the wine industry work in the wine industry. Growers are actively engaged in raising funds for fire victims and providing housing and meeting the needs of, of workers. With farm worker housing already in short supply, the fires have exacerbated that situation and growers are actively trying to help workers find housing. There's also the tangible loss of property. Additionally, there are crop losses, but we believe them to be small. County Act Commissioners are just beginning to do crop surveys to determine the actual amount of the loss but any estimate of loss at this time is premature as nothing more than a guess. It's just far too early. There have also been several media reports of lower prices being paid for grapes as a result of the fires. Those losses will be hard to calculate, but to the extent they are measurable, those losses are crop losses and will be covered by crop insurance. We remain confident in the quality of the wines and believe the pricing issues are short-lived and will be resolved quickly on a case-by-case -case basis. Following the fires, there were questions about residual effects of the fire retardant. We believe all those questions have been answered and that the retardant 
presents no threat or risk to the grapes themselves. There are regulatory issues also. Uh, for example, the California Water Resources Control Board has already received applications for burned or damaged pumps and tanks. Additionally, the board has already approved funding for hydro mulch and erosion control measures in the fire areas. This will be a significant help to growers. The San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board has also been working with the industry, as Tim pointed out, in dealing with potential sediment runoff issues. COG will continue to engage with growers, with regulators, and the legislature to, to assess the effects of the fires and will no doubt seek some necessary and essential legislative and regulatory remedies. We look forward to working with the communities and the chairs of the committees um, as it needs to become clear. In closing, I need to make a personal comment. This has been a really interesting season for growers. Um, the historic rains last winter presented all kinds of access issues for growers who had a difficult time getting in to do basic activities necessary in growing grapes. Then we had the late summer heat which, which created challenges in harvesting the grapes. They dealt with those. Then we had a medfly scare in a quarantine in uh, Senator Dodds and uh, Ms. Uh, Curry's districts. We dealt with those. And then came these fires, and the growers will deal with those. As I have driven through the fire areas, talked with several growers and organizations, and met with the people who lost their homes, I have to say that this is a strong and vibrant industry, and that these are people who are going to continue and they will be strong. I talked to one grower in particular, and she lost her house. And I asked her, what's it like? The shoes she had on her feet, she just bought online at Amazon. Her jacket, her clothes were brand new because she lost everything. And I said, you know, how is that? Her response was, it could have been worse. It could have been worse. She is a shining example of how growers are keeping things in perspective. They are focused on the fact that nothing is as important as helping those who've lost loved ones and helping loved ones to start over as they rebuild. The capacity and the endurance of the human spirit will be the resolve of the 2017 vintage. As Tim pointed out, wine country is open for business. Please come, please visit often. Thank you. My life that I can always I can now talk talk about I couldn't talk about it for about two or three weeks because you saw so much devastation you saw what the farmers went through you saw what happened to the farm workers um, it was a really it's a difficult time and um, but I'm like you said we're resilient and we're all coming back and we're gonna fight hard and and public private partnerships are coming together the government everybody's coming together to try to um, make this uh, better and it's going to take some time. And people ask me, as being an, an assembly member, what's your next steps? And I said, my next steps are five years, maybe longer, to make sure people's lives get back together, make sure they get their homes back. Um, as I'm going to speak just as a farmer, is that sometimes we forget about what could happen. And um, I think many of us just take things for granted. As farmers, that it's not going to happen to me. And um, who would have thought, right? Um, the fire was catastrophic. It went through places like you cannot believe. And there is a, a wonderful map that New York Times did that showed how fast that fire moved. And um, there couldn't have been, I think someone made a comment, there, couldn't been a, there could have been a fire hydrant on every corner and it still wouldn't make a difference. So um, I really appreciate all of you being here and sharing your um, thoughts and your experiences because um, I will say it, it's changed my thinking about a lot of things, uh, personally even. Uh, our barn, I think of myself, if that thing went up, you know, do we even have inventory on it or what's in that thing? All the little things you have never thought of before. Um, so I appreciate that you all have come today. Um, I think what would be important right now that we open up the questions to the panel, would that be okay? Yeah, Chief, um, first of all, I appreciate you being here today. I'm just going to start with you, kind of roll down if that's okay. Um, I have to say, uh, having been involved in uh, fires and floods and earthquakes, um, you know, in Napa County over the years as a county supervisor and then as an assembly member in Lake County, nothing 
on the scale of this, but the work from, uh, you know, from OES, from CAL FIRE, from CHP, you named so many of the agencies, you indicated that so many uh, were, you know, on the job on this. I have to say that uh, I have been so impressed. It was almost like, you know, from my vantage point, I can find fault with anything, just ask my wife. Uh, but seriously, I cannot find any fault uh, with the, the with the response from the team and uh, how that even carried over to the federal government, how quickly they came in, was a result of the actions that the state team took. And then you layer in the local responses from local fire, local sheriffs, uh, police departments. And I'll tell you, I think this is, if, if we can take away a positive from here, it is a shining example for the rest of the country and perhaps the world about how first response can work and can you know work well even amongst uh, you know the damage and and uh, and negativity that so often comes from it. So I'd like to thank you, Chief, uh, for your department and uh, uh, you know Director Gilarducci's efforts. And and it is is get, Director Gilarducci said it's one team, one fight. He was always reminding everybody, you know, at every single meeting. And I've seen that also with the private sector and the wine industry, uh, you, know, at, you know, as well. And, um, and, and I've appreciated, uh, you know, that focus. But now a question. We talk about resiliency. I think, you know, we need a little bit of direction. I know that uh, there's talk about hearings in Sacramento about what we can do to help with that uh, resiliency that we have in uh, response to to citizens. So I think, you know, coming from your department, uh, it would be helpful for us to have, uh, you know, more information about what has federal preemption, you know, to locals in terms of what we can control and what we can't control. Do you have any comments on that? I, I think, you know, as, as we've already kind of hit on a little bit is um, <clears throat> just on the telecommunication side of the house and, uh, you know, our telecoms, as the state is right now dealing with whether we're going to opt in or opt out of FirstNet, uh, our ability for notifications and those. I think those are all key issues that, I, you know, legislature is getting ready to take up currently. I think even on the federal side after uh, Dave Remembrance, Dave Remembrance in uh, Sonoma, I think we, we definitely got uh, the attention because the next week they had hearings. So I, I think we're headed down the path um, of where we need to be. But while I think that my agency and some of the other state agencies working with our local partners are going to need to be the key in working with the legislatures uh, to where we need to go. I, I can't emphasize enough that I believe that <clears throat> unfortunately every disaster has a silver lining. In some case we've, we've, got to, we, we've got to find it and pull it out of the lining there to get it. I'm going to give you a couple examples. I would tell you that um, uh, our communication sites. We like to do more. We like to have more clearance. We're constantly pushed back by environmental issues. And I believe environmental issues. I'm a hunter. Uh, both uh, mammals, uh, uh, deer, uh, elk, geese, duck. But I also want to make sure that there's plenty there for long term. I want sustainability. I think we can get both. But if we don't find a way to find a better way to clear those mountaintops so we can protect those sites, protect our power grid, and find a better way. And, and if we protect the sites and we protect the power, we better make sure that the fiber leading up to it is going to be there as well. We've got to look at those particular issues. Those are all is also issues that I can tell you, whether it be the wine industry or whether it be here uh, in this county or in Ventura where we have avocados, whatever else growing. Again. They make great fire stops. So why wouldn't we try to make bigger corridors to protect the power grid at the same time, providing fire stop while we're out there? I think there's no better time now in our history to relook at it. I, I'm a big fan of putting everything underground. The real question is, is that can we afford it and can the utilities afford it? I, I don't know. I just know that we can't always go back and change the past, but we can build on the future and we can continue to go down that path. Um, I would also tell you that that's a quick example of some of those issues. I'll also tell you that we really need to seriously talk about our first responders. 
um, from law enforcement to fire out there. I used to be able to get uh, 35 strike teams of engines just out of the, from, from Del Norte all the way down to Monterey. Today I get 25 strike teams. Call volume, budgets impacts. Um, we really need to educate at the local level um, people's commitment to our state's mutual aid system. And I would tell you, right now I'm dealing with an issue in Orange County. We have a county supervisor who was concerned that Orange County sent resources out the door to the north while they're in red flag conditions. But what I'd like the supervisor down there to know and the public to know is that if we're not willing to send resources to help our neighbor, and, and I can tell you back in 1950 when they wrote the, wrote the state's national mutual aid agreement, I don't think it was intended that San Diego would be helping Siskiyou County or vice versa. We've gotten that good at how we do business. But we need elected officials to realize you have to give to give, to get. And, and I'll tell you this, I bet, I'd rather receive than to have to, you know, I'd rather give than have to receive resources in today's day and age. But we've got to educate because if, if the elected officials tell our fire chiefs, our law enforcement folks, you can't send resources out because of our own issues, we, elected officials, boards, hire those individuals based upon their knowledge and capabilities, let them run their operation. If we need anything, we probably need more personnel on the ground, more capability. I, I've testified over most of my 30 years in the state, uh, going back to 2003, 2007, 2008, fire sieges. We did a joint report back in 2003, but I can tell you the one thing we haven't done, we still haven't fulfilled all those items on the list so we could do better. Again, it's a matter of priorities. It's a matter of where we put our money, where we invest in it. But again, I think those are the bigger items I would tell you. I, I'm very proud of the <coughs> first responders, as you already heard, uh, at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, the way they gave, the way they put their lives on the line. You know, when you tell firefighters, work on evacuations and don't fight fire, and that's what they did in the first hours of that fire, it's pretty, it, it's pretty hard for those people to do it. You're talking about fire and law personnel whose significant others or families were calling them, hey, we're being evacuated, I can't help you, you're gonna have to evacuate on your own. Uh, there's some tight, some pretty tough things that went on. The number of uh, firefighters that stayed out on line when they were losing their own homes I, I, or in law enforcement. Um, the folks in the uh, emergency medical field, doctors and nurses and EMTs and paramedics, goes beyond what I've seen in most of my career, but I'll tell you, it's, um, it, it, it's quite overwhelming, yet uh, it, it's going to be interesting. I think, you would, I think you're going to hear in the weeks and months to come the, environmental, the behavioral issues that are going to impact the first responder community, uh, not only them, but their families that were directly involved with this incident as a whole. But uh, I would leave you that this state is resilient, our communities are resilient, and we will overcome and we will, over, we will adapt what we need to, to get ahead of it. But those are some of my easy thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just quickly, um, agree with you, Chief, that uh, you know, we've never seen anything like this, right? I mean, that, that fire, as it was coming over from Calistoga down the hill, moving at one to 200 feet per second. Um, and within five hours, you had the majority of those homes in Santa Rosa fully engulfed. Uh, and I, I think you can speak, and you're the veteran here in regards to the fire service, never seen conditions like that on a wildland fire event. Um, Chief, I have some very specific questions uh, for you, but quickly to uh, industry. In County of Sonoma, 20,000 jobs are dependent on tourism, um, and I think we're looking at about six to 7,000 jobs lost, both on a temporary and some on a permanent, in, in particular the service sectors, tasting room, hotels, et cetera. Uh, and we had that three to four weeks of, uh, three weeks of either low wage or lost wages, right? Uh, any thoughts on that? I know that uh, we're working uh, via relief fund on being able to provide assistance. Any items that you want to talk about in uh, regards, because I think a lot of vintners have also stepped up but to keep folks on board even during those difficult times. I'm not enough of an expert in housing policy to probably get, get into it to the degree I should. Um, but, you know, getting people back in some sort of reasonable living conditions where they can focus on their life ahead is obviously a top priority right now. 
Uh, I've been touched to learn, uh, mm -hmm. you know, some of our uh, winery owners who, who have the means have have uh, taken on their their employees. Um, I know. Um, I don't know if they want me to mention one of one of my members. Uh, I know in particular took like 23 employees, uh, you know, onto their property, and I think is um, actively involved in, in getting them housing. You're going to hear a lot of stories like this. Um, but yeah, we were, you know, fundraising, community, getting together, uh, all that stuff. I mean, just just even little things like I know uh, in Sacramento we're going to be doing a fundraiser soon to help with the farm worker uh, community. I know Michael's band's yeah. going to play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, Michael. It's so um, there's, there's also California Wine Strong. So you have all the different regional wine groups who are coming together to create California Wine Strong to raise money. A lot of the money is going to go towards, you know, farm worker housing and that kind of stuff. You've done legislation this year, uh, Senator Don uh, Curry, on Napa specifically, farm worker housing. I think those efforts will probably want to continue to grow in the coming years. Um, also, I just want to comment a little bit about what, uh, um, I forgot your name, sorry, Chief. Oh, yes. What I'm hearing a lot from growers that I, I think is real significant is that they're looking at the price tag of the fires. What do we spend in fighting these fires? It's an incredible amount of money versus what we spend to prevent it. When you're looking at, at the, the wildland urban interface and you're looking at forestry land against agricultural land, against you know, uh, communities, suburbia, all that coming together, we need to, our growers are telling me over and over again, we need to better maintain these forests. We need to spend some time there cutting back some bush, uh, doing some uh, uh, um, safe cu uh, cutting around properties to create defensible spaces so that when uh, OES is called and we bring in everybody to fight these fires, they have a better chance of fighting them because we've done a better job of maintaining. Um, I know we've we put some money this year uh, from uh, cap and trade into that. Uh, there's obviously more we can do, something to think about. It's a big issue I'm hearing from growers all over sure. Napa, Sonoma specifically, as they're looking at where these fires are coming from and how they're coming in and affecting their communities, their workers, their families. Um, as Tim pointed out, I, I've talked to uh, growers as well who've Taking their homes said, come on in, everybody. <laughs> Sebastopol seems to be the place where a lot of people are going, but I don't think Sebastopol has a lot of uh, residential space anymore. <laughs> I think right. it's all rented out now. So. No, absolutely. And uh, it is a significant concern in regards to housing. I know that uh, as uh, the cleanup moves, there's a parallel track focusing on particularly those who are involved, whether it's the wine industry, uh, from those who are uh, farm workers to those who are working in the taste room to ensure that there is a skilled uh, labor force continues to be available and that's really the heart of the two counties as well quickly on on issues in regards to watershed protection i think that's also needs to be the next focus i know oes is working with cal fire and nrcs on that and the national forest service but um you take a look at the sensitive uh, watersheds whether it's napa or sonoma like in mendocino i think there's real concern on that chief i i think the stat is six thousand mutual aid calls went unanswered uh, this past last season, I think that was a, a record uh, in our state's history. And even though I think 25 million was put in from cap and trade, the mutual aid system really needs beef, uh, beefing up. Um, do you want to touch on that? And I know uh, we're running a little shorter time, so 60 seconds on the mutual aid, because never before have we had so many calls go unanswered. I, again, I you know I brought in over 213 um, um, engines from out of state. Um, some 10 states assisted us. Um, that's a delay in getting response in there. So again, going back to the Blue Ribbon Commission, we're still of a request out there for about 106 fire engines that all go to local government, your local cooperators that staff them have additional personnel and capability to send additional resources. So I think that's, a, that's an easy end to get it. Um, I, again, there's more to be done out there. Cap and trade is providing 25 million yeah. to local government agencies out of this. It's a one time that I think you're gonna see the fire service come back and ask for more. Again, we have to work together at the local and state and federal level. Cal Fire working with the local government agencies and us, hand in glove relationship works extremely well. We gotta continue that down the path. And as far as uh, uh, doing more for prevention, absolutely. I, 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 I think I'd, I'll say it, and I think you'll hear Chief Pimlot say it as well. We have to do more. We have to continue to work and put more money into prevention. And my last item is in regards to, as you're focusing, obviously, on all issues of the, um, the cell towers and we lost, uh, whether it's losing power uh, or actually losing towers themselves. The other concern that I know we have, and uh, have Mr. Gerdich has heard a lot from us, is in regards to resiliency on the North Coast. Um, when that one fiber line goes down, as it did, 
uh, during these fires, you impact over 100,000 homes and businesses all the way up to the Oregon border. And the resiliency plan that was advanced about 14 months ago has been tested three times and has not worked in regards to isolating the issue so you isolate the number of individuals that uh, are impacted. And as we're talking about communication, we need to be able to talk about resiliency within that one fiber line uh, to ensure that when we do have a disaster, you don't lose uh, electronic medical records, ATMs, uh, all capability in regards to internet. Uh, and we saw uh, for four days, four straight days, where you had uh, almost half of Mendocino County without cell, without landline, without internet, and without cable television. Um, and that, in, in this, yeah, and, uh, and lack of ability to get cash. In, in the 21st century, that is simply not acceptable. I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm totally agreeing with you, and I would tell you this, there's a lot to learn, not only from us, but from the hurricanes that have hit the United States, especially when you look at the Virgin Islands, you look at Puerto Rico, I, I think there's a lot to learn. I'm working with international fire chiefs. Yeah. Um, there's a lot to be done and to be worked on as a nation together. But I also believe that the stronger we are, the louder we are, California will lead the nation in, in the resolving this issue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, you. You know, all of you have touched just a little bit on kind of next steps and things to think about. Uh, you know, the importance of prevention, clearing mountaintops, clearing power grids, um, our telecommunication system, uh, creating bigger corridors. Are there any other areas where we could be focusing? And I, 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 I'm going to look at in our uh, NRCS. Uh, any other areas where we should be focusing? Because while there is something to be said, you know, about the, the wine industry and Sonoma and Napa counties, this could happen in a lot of places, as has been mentioned in Ventura County with agriculture. I mean, fires are a thing of California. So how do we think about this and what specific takeaways do we have as we move forward? I think something that, um you know is just for each and every landowner every agricultural operation out there uh, to do the the planning ahead of of these these situations these disasters coming along and there again um, that's our agency focus is conservation planning and that includes everything from soil protection uh, water quality you know issues to looking at uh, forestry issues where we have uh, perhaps some forest areas bordering, you know, um, agricultural operations that would benefit from some management, from some thinning, uh, and and look at look at those those types of practices that um, will help you face, you know, the next uh, horrible disaster that's coming along, and and reach out and 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 seek out the agency help from NRCS and others that's available. To, to do the planning, to get some funding, to actually you know, come up with a plan, and then to implement it through, through programs that we have to, uh, to help agricultural folks. Uh, also, I worked for um, Chris Kehoe in 03 when the fires happened in San Diego, and I worked for Pedro Nava when the fires happened here in the hills just uh, east of here. And there were a lot of lessons learned in those fires um, that we've actually implement a lot of changes that I think have resulted in making work a lot easier for OES, but there's also little simple things that we can do with individual people, like telling them when there's a fire, you need to think about two ways out. Because the way that you go, you may be running right into a fire. You need to think of another way out about how to take care of your property when that comes about what you're packing to be ready if a fire happens. Because if you're living in that wildland urban interface area, the reality is that fires are going to happen. It happens all the time. So you need to be prepared for it. And to the extent that we can help property owners, people to recognize that reality and prepare for it, I think is probably a good thing we can do too. Yeah. And I know this is kind of a different tack on answering this question, but one thing uh, we learned was how quickly bad information can, can get out there. And, um, and we just had to work overtime to protect our industry's you know, existence and reputation, it felt like, because it was just, 
crazy how fast, uh, you know, just very incorrect information gets out there. And as, you know, so speaking from an industry point of view, you've got to have a plan in place to be ready to counteract that, uh, you know, too sweet. <laughs> Citizens need to be prepared, I would tell you this. We have a program called Ready, Set, Go that came out of, came out of, our, uh, out of the wildfires in California and became a national model. Ready, Set, Go can actually work towards any disaster that we actually have. Citizens need to prepare their property. They need to be ready to leave at a moment's notice. They need to know what to take and leave when we ask them to leave and have a plan and, and where to set up. And again, as, as Senator McGuire has already indicated, we become so reliant upon our electronic way of doing business. You know, and if you have no means of having money set aside when ATMs don't work or that, you can find yourself on a, on a, on a very tough end. Most people say, hey, be ready to go over 72, day, 72 hours. I would tell you it needs to be more like 96 in some cases. And again, you know, disasters are so large, the larger they are, the more they spread out, the more it takes not only government to respond quickly, but it takes the utilities and everybody else that needs to come in with us. It takes longer them to, re to rebuild and put everything in place. But uh, I, I am proud of uh, the emergency response. I'm proud of our local, state, and federal legislators really has come together, and, and it's really amazing. So uh, two things. I want to uh, focus. We're all talking about emergency response and everything, and we have a joint committee on emergency management that will be discussing these very issues on December 4th, not just in the context of fires, uh, but also uh, we are an earthquake-prone state. What are we going to do? Uh, one of the lessons I think we've learned is, as you've mentioned, we lack resiliency, redundancy in our communication system. In the old days, the church bells rang. The old days, the uh, sirens rang. Uh, today, we have these. And when the cell towers go down, we have nothing. And people rely on these. And so we really do need to uh, try to uh, bang some heads to get some uh, repetitive systems so that if one goes down, we've had that happen here. Most of these cell towers are up in the hills. In this area, that's where our fires generally start. And when those go out, so does communication. Uh, think about a garage door opener. When the electricity's out, you can't get your car out of the garage. I mean, there's, these are little things that we are not prepared to, um, to address because we haven't really thought about it. Although the Ready, Set, Go program is a good program. You say 72 hours, 96, we're being told now two weeks. When we have a major earthquake in this state, that's what's going to happen. These fires, nobody anticipated a fire like this. With 75 mile an hour winds happening in the middle of the night, we all think these things are going to happen at daybreak when we're all able to see, smell, and move out of the way. That just isn't how this is all going to work. So I would invite, and I've mentioned to my colleagues, we're going to be doing a hearing with uh, um, uh, Director Gillarducci and others on emergency management, our preparedness and the lessons we've learned, so that this is all very helpful. As wonderful a job as we did, when Mother Nature raises her ire, you can never be fully prepared. And, and while we talk about the, the UI and, and uh, you know, that urban wildland interface, um, trying to clear brush, we do that here in this community. We've done a lot when it comes to uh, uh, trying to do uh, clearing. And um, uh, we have, um, you know, a process by which we come and, and our firefighters come in to clear uh, areas around our homes. If, if Mother Nature wants to strike, she's going she's gonna to strike. And we can do only so much, but we can do more. And uh, I know that the, the work that was done was quite extraordinary uh, in this case. And I thank you for that. But there will be more coming. And if you are interested, it's December 4th. It will, the hearing will be up in Sacramento. But what I wanted to ask you specifically about this issue, you know, we've got some great vineyards here. Um, the wine community tends to be very tight-knit. We, we have some competitions between wines, but at the end of the day, uh, we really do appreciate that the wine industry is the number two producing agricultural industry over, I guess it's over five or six billion dollars a year in production and, and uh, income to the state. What can we do here uh, in this community? What can the people of uh, Santa Barbara County, San Luis Obispo County, other major grape growing areas do to be helpful to the people uh, and the growers in the Sonoma, Napa, Mendocino area as a result of this fire. Uh, we already, 
we already hear so many stories about uh, you know, winery owners, vineyard owners, you know, reaching out. Um, I mean, honestly, it's like writing checks is a little bit of, of what they can do right now. Uh, you know, there's a lot of fundraising that needs to happen to, uh, you know, deal with some of the devastation that occurred and, and participating in, in those fundraising efforts is, is huge. Um, God, I, I think other than that, I mean, the moral support, the way the, the California wine industry sticks together and has each other's back is, is always inspiring to me. It's why I work at Wine Institute. It's a, it's an amazing place. And, um, you know, there's friendly competitions, like you say, between, you know, Napa and Sonoma and whatnot. But, you know, I got to tell you, I had some pretty great wines from Santa Barbara yesterday, too. <laughs> and the first thing... We knew that. that. Yeah, yeah, I know. Hey, I, I knew that, too. Uh, but first thing out of their mouths was, you know, uh, expressing uh, empathy about what's happening and wanting to know uh, how we can help when we met with uh, some of our members from down here. So, um, you know, the industry is already doing an, an impressive amount. Um, you know, keep it up. <laughs> well, with that, we are going to have to end this beautiful conversation. And we can go on for hours, as we all know. Um, we have another panel. But I'd like to thank you all for attending and giving some insight and giving some, some suggestions because, quite frankly, that's what I'm looking for is for some suggestions. And is there already legislation that's out there that could fulfill this and we're not doing, maybe we need some oversight or maybe it's actually something we need to start over. We've got to look at um, the climate and how things are changing. And we look, um, maybe have to think outside the box that we've been told numerous times during this trek. So. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much, and I hope you'll be able to join us on December 4th as we uh, probably delve into it a little bit deeper. So, again, thank you very much for attending today. Okay, prior to, uh, as uh, they leave, uh, panel two can make their way up here, and uh, with that, uh, Assembly Member Limon. There are just two folks uh, that I want to introduce, and one of them is just walking out, Monica Solorzano, sorry, with uh, UC Santa Barbara's Government Relations. I just want to make sure they've been very involved in emergency response, and we also know that there's other types of emergencies um, that come through here as well. And I also want to introduce uh, Kathy Fisher, who's our Santa Barbara County Agriculture Commissioner, who is here, um, who's very much paying attention to uh, the conversation as it relates to our county. So thank you for being here. Great, perfect. Well, we're going to go right into panel number two. Let me introduce uh, the panel. The first uh, panel member is Jim Farrar. He's the director of the University of California Statewide Integrated Pest Management Program. And then we'll hear from Bob Wynn, the statewide coordinator for Pierce's Disease uh, Control Program here uh, with the California Department of Food, Food and Agriculture. And then finally, we will uh, then hear from Mike Testa, the secretary of the California Association of Wine Grape Growers and general manager for the Coastal Vineyard Care Associates. Excuse me. And we have one more person that just arrived. Correct. My name, of course. My name is Wes Hagen. I am the vineyard manager uh, and winemaker uh, raconteur for uh, Jay Wilkes Wines here in San Barbara County. Fantastic. Happy to have you. Excited to be here. Okay. So, Dr. Farrar, start. Switch. Oh, all right. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Senator Dodd. Um, uh, and thank you for the invitation to present this morning. Uh, my name is Jim Farrar. I'm the director of the University of California Statewide Integrated Pest Management Program. Uh, integrated pest management is a science-based approach to managing pests while minimizing economic, human health, and environmental risks from pests and pest management practices. Pests pose economic, human health, and environmental risks, and pest management practices pose economic, human health, and environmental risks. Minimizing these risks while managing pests is the goal of integrated pest management. The program began in 1979 at the direction of the state legislature and currently consists of 11 integrated pest management advisors located throughout California and 20 staff in Davis working to translate university science into safe, economical, and effective pest management tools. We currently get over 30,000 web hits per day from people looking for solutions to pest management problems. 
Integrated Pest Management is located in the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources Division, which is a statewide cooperative extension division of the university. ANR has several hundred academics located in over 50 county offices on nine research and extension centers and on four UC campuses. Some of the programs in ANR that you may recognize are Cooperative Extension, 4-H, Master Gardeners, California Institute for Water Resources, and of course, my program, Integrated Pest Management. You asked me to give an update on pests and diseases in California wine grapes. I would like to start by setting the context, and the previous panel did quite a bit of this already, setting the context of California wine grape production. In 2015, California agriculture produced a farm gate value of $47 billion, $20 billion more than the second agricultural state, Iowa. Grapes, all grapes, that is table raisin and wine grapes, are the third leading commodity in California behind dairy and almonds, with a farm gate value of almost $5 billion. Half of the California grape value is wine grapes, or $2.5 billion. And this morning we heard about the multiplier effect when you take those wine grapes and turn them into wine. Uh, in 2015, one and a half billion dollars in wine was exported from California to other countries. Many people know the Napa Sonoma region for wine grape production, but there is significant wine grape acreage in other areas in California, as we heard about this morning. Today, I wanna to talk about powdery mildew, red blotch virus, grapevine leaf roll associated virus, and its vector, mealybugs. Bob Wynn from CDFA will discuss Pierce's disease and glassy wing sharpshooter. And I will also touch on weed management with glyphosate. Powdery mildew is caused by a fungus that grows on any green tissue of the grape plant. In wine grapes, more pounds of pesticides are applied to manage powdery mildew than any other pest or disease. Growers apply fungicides when a weather-based disease forecasting model indicates a risk of infection. The most commonly used fungicide is sulfur, and the application rate is many pounds per acre, which is why um, uh, the, the most pounds of pesticide are applied for powdery mildew. There are several other fungicides that control the disease. In the last few years, the fungus has developed resistance to one of the most commonly used classes of fungicides, the strobilurons. Recent surveys in the North Coast have indicated that 90% of powdery mildew isolates were uh, resistant to that class of fungicides. One potential solution is breeding wine grapes to be resistant to powdery mildew. Professor Andy Walker at UC Davis has succeeded in crossing wine grapes with a wild grape species that is naturally resistant to powdery mildew, and then crossing the offspring back to the wine grape variety for several generations. The drawback is that the wine industry is largely based on named varietals. Even if Dr. Walker's new resistant variety is more than 95% of the original parent, it is not 100% of the original varietal and cannot be marketed under, under the same name. This is also true for a traditional breeding program for Pierce's disease resistance. So let me emphasize that this is traditional breeding for resistance, not genetic engineering to produce GM crops. Red blotch is a relatively new, dis uh, newly discovered disease caused by a virus. Red blotch was first identified in late 2008. A virus identified as the potential cause in 2011 and Later, that was scientifically established in 2014. Red blotch virus was later found in herbarium specimens dating back to the 1940s, so we know that it's been around in California since then. In 2016, researchers discovered that uh, it was vectored by three-cornered alfalfa hopper, and there may be other vectors out there that we don't know about yet. For virus disease research, this was incredibly rapid progress. Red blotch causes delayed berry ripening, and sugar levels are lower 
therefore reducing the quality of the grapes. The disease continues to be identified in new areas, either because it is spreading by vectors that we don't know yet, or because it was not recognized before. Several research labs are working on red blotch and management methods. Red blotch and the disease I will talk about next, leaf roll, illustrate the importance of nursery transplants that are free of all known diseases. Leaf roll associated virus is transmitted by mealybugs. Leaf roll and red blotch are the reasons that grapes turn red in the fall. This is not normal fall color, but an indication of disease. We have had three mealybug species in grapes in California for a long time, but in the past 12 years have seen the continuing spread of the introduced vine mealybug. All four mealybugs vector leaf roll virus. Leaf roll does not kill plants, but does reduce yields 10 to 20%, delays ripening by three to four weeks, and reduces sugar levels, all which impact quality. Therefore, it is a drag on yield and also uh, decreases quality year after year, but doesn't kill the vines. Since mealybugs can spread the virus from neighboring infected fields or from just a few infected vines within a field, the problem gets worse every year. The best control is to start with certified nursery transplants that do not have leaf roll virus or mealybugs. The source for virus tested clean propagation material is the Foundation Plant Services at UC Davis and the nurseries that propagate and sell registered and certified grapevine material. Once the um, clean vines are in the field, it is important to prevent mealybugs from moving the virus from neighboring fields. In some cases, growers in a specific local region have banded together to share trap counts and to coordinate mealybug treatments for greater effectiveness. Bob Wynn is going to discuss Pierce's disease and glassy wind sharpshooter and the expansion of the grower funded PD GWIS program to other pests. I just wanted to emphasize the continued importance of our native sharpshooters in Pierce's disease spread in the northern California regions that do not have glassy wind sharpshooter. The last issue I want to mention is unintended consequences of social pressure on glyphosate. In wine grape production, the soil directly under the vines needs to be free of weeds to avoid competition for water and nutrients. Growers try to avoid tillage in order to comply with Natural Resources Conservation Service and salmon safe guidelines. Therefore, the area under the vines is often sprayed with post-emergent, that means after the weeds have germinated, herbicides. Until recently, the product of choice for effectiveness, price, and applicator safety was glyphosate, often sold under the trade name Roundup. Recent social pressure resulting from the International Agency for Research on Cancer labeling glyphosate a probable human carcinogen and news stories indicating detection of glyphosate in wine have caused some growers to look at other herbicides. The other choices are glufosinate, which is more risky to applicators, less effective and more expensive, and Paraquat, which has similar price and effectiveness, but much greater risk to applicators. Paraquat is a restricted use pesticide that is highly toxic to humans. Three teaspoons can kill an adult. It has a higher risk danger level label in contrast to the lower risk caution label for glyphosate. This is an example of increased risk to human health as a result of misplaced public perception of risk. Um, you asked me to speak a little bit about what you can do to help address the issues. I just wanna say the county agricultural commissioners and county-based cooperative extension advisors are vital in the continued effort to manage wine grape pests and diseases. They are the frontline support for growers and pest control advisors in this effort. Continuing or increased support for these two groups is critical. University of California scientists have been central in understanding these pest and disease problems and developing management strategies. Foundation plant services and the nursery certification program are central to planting new vineyards with clean 
disease-free transplants. The continued support for research from the Pierce's Disease Glassy Wing Sharpshooter Program managed through CDFA is also important for providing research funding and ensuring that research focuses on avenues of inquiry most likely to lead to useful and effective controls. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Farrar. Now we'll uh, move to uh, Bob Wynn. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that was a loud one. <laughs> Wanted to make sure everybody's awake out there. Uh, thank you, chairs and members of the joint committees. I really appreciate the opportunity to testify at the hearing this morning. Um, and uh, from, on behalf of CDFA, I'd also like to uh, express our appreciation to all of those in terms of the fires who literally laid their life on the line fighting those fires uh, and all other first responders, as well as our condolences to all of those folks who were affected and many of our colleagues were. Today I'm going to talk about the Pierce's Disease Program, which is kind of a microcosm of our mission at CDFA, and that is to address invasive species and protect uh, California agriculture and the economy from those invasive species by responding to these to infestations of such. Um, but first, uh, I want to, as the chief mentioned, we don't do this alone. It's a teamwork effort, as Dr. Farrar indicated. Um, and I appreciate the introduction of, of Kathy Fisher, who's the Ag Commissioner here in Santa Barbara County. Uh, in this particular program, um, as Senator Dodd probably knows by now, this is started out 17 years ago as a primarily locally based program coordinated by CDFA, but really all the work on the ground is done by the Ag Commissioners in all of the counties, and we really appreciate and they're absolute partners in all of our programs, but especially in this one, which was laid out um, in statute at the beginning of the program. Uh, also, the industry, uh, obviously we couldn't do this without the cooperation of folks like COG, Wine Institute, and the growers that are out there, and some of which are here today. Um, in addition to that, obviously UC, we work very closely with UC on research, I'll be talking about that, and not only on basic research, but applied research to implement our operational program. Uh, in addition to that, obviously the legislature and the USDA have been critical in providing funding to our program uh, over the years. This is uh, the California Pierce's Disease Program is a national program. Uh, we've um, been lucky enough to have support from USDA over the last 17 years to the tune of almost $400 million to conduct this program. And as you can see, it's a, it's a worthwhile investment in the industry in California. I uh, brought and distributed some figures from Wine America this morning that places the value of the wine industry in the U.S. Uh, at $219 billion, as well as the $19 billion a year in federal taxes paid by uh, the, the national wine grape industry. Um, and obviously, as uh, uh, Tim Schmelzer mentioned, that 85% of that uh, wine and wine grape comes from California. Even though every state in the nation produces wine, every state in the nation obviously does not grow wine grapes. So guess where those grapes and juices are coming from, California. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment and how we're going to expand that economic impact because of the direct result of our partnership with the University of California in the next couple of years. Uh, the Pierce's Disease Program is kind of a, uh, an example of how we respond to invasive pests and disease programs at CDFA. This one happened to start back in 1999 in an area called Temecula of Southern California. Um, between 1997 and 1999, Temecula lost over half of the acreage of vineyards in that area. And it's, if you know that area, it's, a, uh, it's kind of the Napa Valley of the Southern California. It's a very uh, attractive tourism um, uh, destination for all those folks in Southern California. Uh, who want to go out, visit wine, receive vineyards, uh, and taste the wine. Um, when we saw that area in 1999 um, and the situation down there, we witnessed vine whole vineyards that were devastated by this disease. And the new vector that we had just heard from the Ag Commissioner in Southern California that was causing this. 
Pierce's disease is a bacterial disease and the vector transmits the bacteria into grapevines. The bacteria uh, multiplies and coagulates to the extent that it cuts off the xylem tissue of the plant or the water conducting tissue and the plant essentially starves of moisture and dies. There is no cure even though we have uh, some very significant research uh, that will come online in the next couple of years. Um, that situation in Temecula got everybody's attention, including the governor, the legislature, USDA, obviously the Secretary of Agriculture was Bill Lyons back then, uh, and of course mine because I was Director of Plant Health Services and CDFA at that point in time. So in late 1999, we visited with all those folks. Um, uh, the Assembly Ag Commit Committee was uh, instrumental in, in kind of setting up the program, having their first hearing in Riverside, California, in Riverside County, to kind of air the, the issues in that area. So CDFA recognizing all this uh, and the significance of the vector pathogen combination and the potential effect on industry, developed and implemented a program response. And again, this is typical of what we do in these cases with our partners. In this particular case, uh, that program response involved a statewide survey uh, to determine the distribution of the pests, containment of the spread of the pests, and I'm talking about glassy wing sharpshooter, uh, rapid response to infestations, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, research, which was we saw as the, uh, the ultimate solution to the issue, not vector control, but actual solutions to the disease itself, and public outreach. And I'll talk about the public outreach because it was so critical in, in us determining where this pest was in the state. Um, I'll also talk, a year later in 2001, the industry found that this was such a significant problem and they also realized that, you know, we can't just rely on government to step up and fund this issue. So they took it upon themselves, and some of the folks who were around at the formative stages of the Pierce's Disease Glassy Wing Sharpshooter Board, um, I still communicate and are still our ambassadors out there uh, to USDA, to the grower community, and to others to continue the support for this program, which is critical. So the actual board was created in 2001 by uh, legislation, um, and it created the board and membership criteria, and the membership criteria of that board is made up of 15 members, um, producers, combination of producers who are not also processors, uh, uh, processors who are also producers, and one public member. Uh, so part of the legislation also authorized an assessment because the industry wanted to help fund this program. So they began assessing themselves in, in the year 2001 to fund research and other activities to manage the pests and disease in this state. Um, it also, obviously in that statute, laid out the responsibilities of the board, which essentially are to recommend to the secretary and advise the secretary on how to spend the industry funds going into this program. Uh, but it, do, it does a lot more. It's a, it's a continued partnership between us and industry, and I manage that board. Uh, I was in Washington, D.C. last week to continue to educate our congressional delegation as well as USDA folks as to the importance of the continued support for this program. It's been 70, uh, 17 years um, and there's a little complacency in areas uh, just because we've done such a good job of controlling the vector and the spread of the disease. Um, I took three members of that board with me and they do a wonderful job of, of educating our congressional delegation. and. Obviously, as you folks know, you'd rather hear from folks that are out there on the line of fire as opposed to bureaucrats like me. So that's important for us to continue. Um, so the highlights of the program and our accomplishments, we, as I indicated, we surveyed the state initially in this program to determine the distribution of glassy wing sharpshooter, even though there are other vectors of this disease. Senator Dodd uh, well knows that Napa and Sonoma County and Senator McGuire 
are probably the uh, hottest spots for incidences of Pierce's disease. However, you do not have glassy-wing sharpshooter. It would be a lot worse if you did. Uh, what you have up there are perimeter effects on vineyards uh, from blue-green sharpshooters and other vectors, we think, coming out of the riparian areas uh, and affecting the perimeter. 30 to $40 million loss in potential profits or income from the wine industry in those two counties because they can't plant along those. I'm sorry about that. Um, so we surveyed, determined that this, the glasswing sharpshooter infested Kern County South in this state, that the rest of the state luckily was either free from or had small incipient infestations. Uh, we followed that up with control quarantine regulations to ensure that we didn't spread glasswing sharpshooter out of Southern California into those non-infested areas. Uh, we also responded to those small incipient infestations, uh, Chico in Butte County, uh, Solano County, Contra Costa County, Santa Clara County. We've had 18 separate successful eradications of incipient infestations to keep those areas free from this pest. Uh, and we established research priorities along with UC and the industry to essentially, again, find solutions ultimately to the disease. Um, so let me talk, and I'm going to be a little bit brief here because I know we're, yes. we're uh, a little bit behind on time. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the research that we've done. And as Dr. Farrar mentioned, Dr. Andrew Walker has crossed grapevines to uh, find solutions to powdery mildew. And I, I happen to grow a few grapes, not nearly as much as others in the room, uh, but I know what powdery mildew is and what an issue it is, and um, it creates a lot of work for me personally. So I'm glad he's doing that. But also in that work, he's uh, crossed uh, a couple of, ver of uh, varieties of, of uh, grapevines, species of grapevines, and I can tell you Vitus Arizonica, which is the one from, from southern Arizona that has resistance to Pierce's disease, but it does not make good wine. He's crossed that with Vitus vinifera, a which is a characteristic species of wine grape that we use to make our wonderful wines here in California and elsewhere. Uh, he's done that for the last 12 years, and now we have a 97% Vitus vinifera uh, species grape, and he's... Dr. Walker has made wine out of these for probably eight years now, um, and that's how he's developed and crossed classically breeding-wise uh, up to the 97%. Uh, those are in test plots, three areas in Napa <coughs> County, uh, Texas, Alabama, and Florida, and they're doing very well everywhere. Uh, they will be released commercially in June of 2020. So uh, we're, uh, the folks in the other states are obviously chomping at the bits to get those grapevines in the ground. Texas, I think, has probably expanded their plantings a little bit at this point. But that, and I mentioned exp you know, augmenting that $219 billion economic impact, those states who can't grow grapes in the southeastern part of the United States, their predominant problem, even though they have others, is Pierce's disease. That will take that off the table. Uh, so it's important work. Uh, the industry has funded all that. Uh, the amount of research funding going into this program has been over $95 million, uh, significant amount by California industry, up to $30, $35 million. So they've done their part. In addition to that, the board itself, the PD board, has, has gone through three referendums, and they voted every five years to continue this program overwhelmingly. Uh, two referendums ago, they expanded their authority to provide funding for research and education on other designated pests and diseases, some of which Dr. Farrar talked about. Uh, Senator Dodd, you know well the European grapevine moss situation. Um, that was one of the designated pests, and the board actually f provided funding for that. Also, brown marmorate stink bug, leaf roll virus red blotch, fan leaf virus, and all mealybugs are on their list of, of research programs that the California industry through the PD board is providing funding for. Great, so. thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Testa? Yeah, thank you again for, for having me. I appreciate this opportunity. That should help. Uh, I currently live in San Inez and I've, 
um, fourth generation farmer out of Santa Barbara County. Uh, happy to call God's country home. There we go. Um, but prior to being the general manager and partner at Coastal Vineyard Care, which is um, located in Santa Barbara County, farming several different vineyards as a vineyard management company and as a labor contractor, I had a great opportunity to work for the Gallo family farming in um, multiple regions across California. So I have experience farming in the Central Valley as well as Northern California. And they all are truly uh, phenomenal places to live and to work and to grow grapes. Incredible communities everywhere. And this is a, a really small wine industry. So the last uh, session uh, about the um, fire was uh, r really, I think, drove home some points that, that this industry is strong and communal um, and that it really does uh, af affect the entire industry. And a case in point, um, even though I farm entirely in Santa Barbara County, I sell quite a few grapes to Napa and Sonoma wineries. Uh, we have a unique terroir down here and produce phenomenal grapes, and, and they're utilizing those wines in, in their tasting rooms. And so uh, the, the potential for a, a lost um, tourism traffic in, in Napa and Sonoma, that, that hurts my business because ultimately that could slow down the sales uh, in the tasting room. And so um, I, I'm glad to hear Tim and Michael both uh, echo that, you know, California is open for business. But anyways... To focus more about um, pests and disease, uh, these gentlemen here are, are the experts and I won't pretend to know uh, a fraction of what they know, but I can prioritize as a grower where I feel um, the biggest opportunities are to move forward. And for me, it, it, it's red blotch. And, and this is really something that's been identified uh, re relatively recently, but fairly quickly with the UC extension. Um, in fact, they were out at, at a vineyard that I farmed trapping this alfalfa tree horn. Um, and so it's really encouraging that we've identified w potentially the major vector, but there could be other vectors out there that we need to identify. But, but to me, the gap is, is coming up with an eradication plan. And how do we now move forward um, to eradicate this pest and, and so that we can stop the spread of red blotch? I was farming in Napa when, when the European grapevine moth was detected, and I was um, uh, it, it, it incredibly encouraged at how fast that was eradicated with communal support and, and uh, guidance um, from the county level and and uh, so I'm hoping that that's the future for red blotch um, in addition the second biggest disease uh, threat that I have uh, in, in terms of economic uh, impact is is leaf roll as well leaf roll has been a, a problem for us for uh, decades but only recently has the vine mealy bug uh, hit such a infestation level that it's it's becoming um, really economically difficult to continue to farm many of our vineyards um, and we do not have uh, effective tools to eradicate mealybug. Uh, right now, the, the be best tool I have at my disposal is Mavento, of which I can only pie twice. Um, the Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in the Central Coast, we can see four to five generations of mealybugs. And so if I only have two opportunities to apply that, that chemical, how can I eradicate that pest? I can't. Um, the the uh, feedback from the chemical companies, which I would lean on, uh, hopefully they're, they're financially incentivized to create a, a product would be that the amount of money and research and um, investment to create a, a product that help, could help us eradicate me the bug, the potential for that to be um, rejected or to held up um, and not approved is enough of a, of a deterrent uh, to see some progress in these uh, development of new tools and chemicals. So. For me, I would, I would love to see some more support and um, collaboration in, in creating uh, tools and, and opportunities to eradicate these two uh, major pests and vectors um, because these are, these are uh, problematic across the entire state. Um, to kind of give you some perspective on Santa Barbara County versus Napa, uh, Sonoma, Northern California, Red Blotch, um, and leaf roll, uh, the Im impact is not all, uh, it's not the same in every area, it's not the same in every variety. For instance, if, if uh, Cabernet Vineyard in Napa has red blotch, chances are that grower is gonna be very motivated to replant that immediately because the cost of those grapes are so high and the quality is so heavily impacted. However, a Chardonnay grower or a Sauvignon Blanc grower on the Central Coast with red blotch, there may not be as much economic impact and motivation to replant that because those are varieties that are gonna ripen earlier and perhaps getting to that level of ripeness is not as important 
In addition, the cost of our, our grapes are much lower than Napa, and so we may not have that variable. The, the problem there is that we have growers that are less incentivized to replant and make that investment themselves. And so with mealy bug and leaf roll, um, we continue to see these spread because of uh, perhaps um, the, the economic uh, motivation may not be there on the Central Coast as much. And so potentially some, some uh, thoughts on, on moving forward could be, again, collaboration. Um, in the uh, Farm Bill, there was a, a tree replant program, but it was relatively small for red blotch. Uh, perhaps for leaf roll, we can look at something like that um, to help motivate and incentivize uh, growers to, to try to clean up uh, their vineyards as much as possible. Um, the, other, the other disease issues that, that uh, Jim and Bob mentioned are, are really important. Uh, Pierce's disease, where I first came out of college and started working um, right after uh, the program was initiated that Bob mentioned, and it was one of my first jobs was, was scouting on the yellow sticky traps for sharpshooters. And as an industry, we've continued to maintain that for the last 20 years, uh, seven, 17, 18 years. Um, but only recently here with the warm winters we've had, we are seeing a, a nether resurgence of this pest, especially here on the central coast. Uh, we haven't had cold enough winters to kill the populations, and they're having a devastating economic impact on us now. And so, thankfully, this, you know, we have the support um, and we believe we have the tools to, to fight the Pierce's disease. Um, and I'll try not to talk too much longer. Other important issues to me in Santa Barbara County are, as well as across California, would be labor and water. Um, something that makes us unique here in Santa Barbara County, are, as well as San Luis Obispo County, well, the Central Coast in general, we only have one opportunity for water, and that's groundwater. And so when I farmed in Napa in Northern California, there are riparian right ish opportunities, and in the Central Valley, there are water district opportunities. Um, but for us, groundwater is so important, and um, I just want to underscore or echo that. Uh, in, um, that's priority number one for, for all farmers. And then labor, um, and labor continues to be a challenge um, everywhere in the state of California for all growers, um, for grape, growers. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, afford to pay our laborers as much as other commodities, such as uh, in Santa Barbara County, the number one um, uh, cash crop is, is going, or currently is, is berries. So strawberries and cane berries, blackberries, raspberries, those are far more perishable products, and so they can afford to pay laborers a high, higher rate than, than a grape grower can because they're more lucrative to grow. And so we continue to struggle uh, to, to supply labor. H2A is, is not a good solution uh, for grape growers. It would just uh, be cost prohibitive um, to us. Um, and there are some, some positive um, uh, potentials with H2C, but some uh, uh, problematic options as well. Um, mainly for me, the, the lack of consideration for the existing workforce. So anyways, I'll... Um, I'll be available for questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, our next speaker is Wes Hagen. He's a winemaker and brand ambassador test, test. for Jay Wilkes Wine. Welcome. Well, if brevity be the soul of wit, I'm about to get witty on you. Um, I'm going to keep this really short. Uh, if anyone knows you, first of all, thank you, Assembly members and senators, for having me today. And uh, Senator Jackson, it's lovely to see you back at home. Thank you for being here. Um, I am a winemaker and a wine grower. I've been in both family business as well as other business. I wanted to uh, hit three points today and take us from blue-green sharpshooter to glassy wing sharpshooter, maybe to 10,000 feet up and ask, what are we really doing here today? Uh, California is known for two things in my world, and that one is technology and the other is wine, and they both have a very important idea. Technology has got us more connected but less personally connected than any other thing in my lifetime. We communicate with our thumbs. And I'd like to suggest that a bottle of wine is an investment. An investment to keep the people we love at table for an extra hour every day. My wife and I have a rule. We have a box in the middle of our dining room table. We open it up every evening at six o'clock, dump our phones in, lock it up, and it can come out at eight o'clock. Wine is so important to keep us connected. And as we talk about fires and we talk about pests, I think it was important to stop and say how important wine is to live as a modern society. Wine is responsible for democracy. Wine is responsible for microbiology. Wine is responsible for cosmology. And if you want to know, I can tell you afterwards how that's possible. 
But obviously wine to me is as important as anything else. I'm a third and a half generation Californian. What I wanted to talk about on the research side is a brand new study last week out of UCR that was a transdisciplinary study on Pierce's disease. And what they found was there was microbial activity within the vine that showed uh, a resistance. So there's a few things. I mean, we were looking at Cal Poly, UC Davis, Cal State Fresno, Sonoma State. I think those are our major um, places that we need to fund. Perhaps the wine industry hasn't done as good of a job of funding uh, research in our industry as places like Australia, Germany, France, Italy. And I think we also have to look at ourselves to say what can we do to push wine and wine research further as an industry, as well as uh, you know, expecting the state to step up. Um, so I'm really looking at this idea of microbial-based models moving forward. I mean, if, we're, if anything's new in the last five years in wine, it's this idea of microbial terroir, this idea of all the things that are alive, the dynamic systems that are alive in vineyards, and how can we manipulate those systems instead of applying chemicals? So I think we've learned that you know, better chemicals make better pathogens, both medically and agriculturally. So I think these are the things that we really need to focus on. Uh, the last thing I wanted to touch on is the genius of this industry. There is not another industry in the world that contains the amount of untapped genius as the wine industry. You look at the people that are part of this industry, lawyers, doctors, industry, people from entertainment, people from technology, we are all in this because we were looking for a very good reason to spend our money and a very good reason to help justify drinking a bottle of wine every day. Now, I think personally that we need to ask ourselves, how can we harness this genius? If I just think about Santa Barbara wine, the guy who invented the modern synthesizer, a guy who has a, uh, a, 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 an Academy Award for, um, you know, for editing. I mean, these are just two people that popped up in my mind. You take Napa Sonoma, you take Lake County, you take everybody involved, you take Lodi. The amount of agricultural knowledge in Lodi probably is greater than that in Napa Sonoma. How do we capture the genius of this industry? And I'm going to put myself on the line and give each one of you my card and say, if you would like me to start thinking about this idea of how we can capture the genius of this industry to move this forward, to have these conversations, and the most important thing, to get back to table and participate in one of the last meaningful rituals we have in this country, making eye contact, having a glass of wine, and discussing our passions. So thank you again, and I'm done. Well, I am glad you joined this panel. I really <laughs> am. I if you knew me and you knew there was an extra microphone, you're not all that surprised I'm here. <laughs> well, you know, we probably should have a box up here to put place all our phones while this uh, hearing is ongoing. So uh, I, I may take you up on that at, at, at my dinner table as well. This is not a proper symposium uh, in an Athenian sense without four hours of drinking. Well, with that, uh, do we have uh, questions? Do we want to start on this end this time, uh, Senator? Just a couple, and thank you, Wes. I, I, uh, I appreciate your pointing out that we have sort of lost that human touch with technology. Um, I'm reminded I have a niece who uh, came over to my house with a friend of hers. My niece now has just graduated UCSB about a year ago. And the two of them were sitting on the couch texting, but they were texting each other. Um, and uh, so uh, I think a bottle of wine might very well help people to kind of regain that sense of, of personal interaction, which is so missing in, in today's world. But, but uh, an interesting approach to the discussion, and I thank you. I'm curious, um, you mentioned Glassy Wing Sharpshooter 1999. That was my first year in the State Assembly. And uh, um, I remember it started in Temecula, but it was also impacting us, I believe, here in Santa Barbara County. Um, and what, we, what the county did is the industry was a little frantic about the potential devastation and did, in fact, contribute some resources, uh, either by a self-tax or by uh, some method, to engage in some of that research. But I think it was Wes or, or Mike mentioned that we are not as, uh, that, that the industry has not been as engaged in some of this research and that um, the, the state uh, has been reluctant to really jump in 
and certainly under this governor, he's always very reluctant to, to jump in with money. So is there something we can do to incentivize the industry, um, not only to capture the genius and the geniuses, and we all know who some of them are in all our different counties and are delighted that they've chosen wine and, and the Vintner um, experience to uh, demonstrate some of their um, enthusiasm for life. But is there something we can do to get the wine industry uh, potentially uh, more proactive in some of these issues because I share with you the fact that the more we put chemicals into things, uh, the more toxic, just by definition, we create our environment. Is, and I would see the wine industry as perhaps being a leader in this. Any, any thoughts on what we could be doing? Well, thank you, Senator. I'll take a first shot at that. And uh, I just kind of you know, talked about the tip of the iceberg in terms of industry involvement in these programs. Uh, you mentioned Santa Barbara County's uh, efforts back in 1999-2000, and Santa Barbara County, as Commissioner Fisher can tell you, is in a unique situation. You have half the county that's infested with, with glass wing sharpshooter and half the county that isn't. So those are, the, those are the reasons that we set up the controls that we did. Uh, but in terms of industry being involved in these programs, uh, back in 2011-12, 2011-12, the governor had to make some changes in the state because of the deficit situation we all faced. Uh, at that point in time, for the first time in the life of this program, we lost state general fund support. Necessarily so, I think, because of the overarching situation in the state the economy. Uh, but we maintained our federal support, and the industry, through the PD board, stepped up to fund a lot of areas that were funded with state general fund with their own assessment funds. So, and that, can, you know, I can talk ad nauseum about the research efforts. On the uh, PD board, we have a, a winery owner, winemaker, viticulturalist out of uh, the Salinas Valley who's been a member from the inception of the board, who manages essentially our research program. Uh, he's very scientifically inclined. He's gone many steps further than, than you would expect an industry member to get involved in these programs. So I think, oh, by the way, uh, our uh, appreciation goes out to the legislature and California Association of Wine Grape Growers this year uh, because the legislator, uh, legislature provided $5 million in one year uh, general fund augmentation to our budget uh, just because of the uh, implications on the federal level. But that's, uh, I don't know if anyone else would like to speak to that. I could just have one word, and that's Australia. They are kicking our butts, and they are funding, and they are research maniacs. So I suggest you guys take a trip down under on a budget and drink some Australian wine, talk to them about how they get their industry involved because they're funding their industry 10 times more than we are. And we need to invest in ourselves, and we need to almost shame California wine into actually paying what is necessary to make these things. Uh, I mean, we're going to have a situation uh, with a vector that's going to hit California wine at some point, just like these fires. And we're going to look back, and we're going to ask ourselves, why, we, why weren't we prepared? And it's, it's a preparation issue, and I think if I look at any culture today that's doing a better, the best job in the, in the world, uh, I'll go back to that one word, Australia. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, uh, we, you know, one of the things uh, as a first year term member that I've heard a lot from our ag world is um, how uh, the importance of healthy soil. And so I think you've started to talk about it, but I don't know if you could just talk a little bit more about what we're doing to, main, to make sure that our soil is healthy. Um, you know, folks here have talked about different strategies. Um, I think you started to touch on that when you talked about the microbial, but I will let you take it away in terms of what we are doing as an industry. Um, to make sure that the healthy soil is part of what's contributing to a better and more fruitful uh, yield. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, healthy soil is vital to um, healthy crops and healthy people. Um, wine grapes, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, don't require tillage, and tillage is one of the things that uh, really disrupts the soil microbiology. Um, so um, we're very fortunate that, that um, that's not necessary in wine grape production. Um, 
In the last 20 to 25 years, we've seen a really great increase in the number of growers using cover crops in the middles in the, in the vineyards, um, which really contributes to uh, soil health and soil microbiology um, to maintain that health. So I, I think that um, we've got a pretty significant change that's already happening. Um, and it's just, um, you know, the, stu the studies to document um, some of the things that um, are really beneficial, um, just to remind us that we need to keep doing the, these things that we know are good practice. Um, some of it's driven by uh, NRCS and their, um, their interest in um, conserving resources, particularly soil resources. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a very important area in, um, in all of agriculture, but uh, also particularly in wine grape production. Thanks. Senator McGuire. Quick question. Uh, Jim, in, in, apologize if I miss this, but can you just do a little bit of a deeper dive, and I know we're, we're tight on time, in regards to uh, red blotch and eradication and eradication plan, and just go into that a little bit further. OK. Um, so uh, I'm not sure about an eradication plan, um, primarily because red blotch virus was found in a uh, wild grape herbarium specimen okay. in the UC Davis herbarium dating back to the 1940s. Mm. Um, so the, the virus has been in the state for decades. Um, the virus goes to... Um, uh, wild grape species that grow in California. So um, eradication is probably too high of a bar. Um, certainly we can manage uh, a lot better than we have been. And I think that primarily starts with making sure that the planting material that's going into the ground is free of uh, red blotch virus and all other um, known viruses and, and other diseases. Um, and starting with that clean material is vital um, to then not having problems down the road. But Jim, I think that you talk, at least, and I can only speak for those who are uh, up in the north area of the state, those nurseries have struggled uh, on that front. So go into that a bit. Right. So the, um, the Foundation Plant Services um, group at UC Davis provides that clean material to the nurseries, and then um, it's the nurseries that need to develop that um, certified clean material for, for the growers to plant. Um, and. Um, I agree that you know we've we've got to focus some attention on um, testing protocols and propagation protocols to make sure that um, the material coming out of those nurseries is really clean um, and certified um, disease tested. Assembly member, just a, just a quick question. Um, so a little bit on the rootstock, you know, moving it from one nursery to another, that always makes me a little bit nervous because you don't know how well people take care of their healthy soil. Grafting, I mean, you graft a lot of the, um, the grapes many times. Um, is there a correlation at all with just, you know, the grafting process and for any of these diseases? Well, certainly if you start with um, infested budwood, then whatever material you're propagating by grafting um, will then also be infected. So yeah, we, we have to make sure that that um, budwood source, that uh, original material is, is um, clean of those viruses. And who monitors that? Um, you know, I'm not sure about the regulatory end of that, but I know that the, um, the group that keeps the, the original source material clean is Foundation Plant Services, and then they um, provide that material to the nurseries that propagate it under these um, protocols for making sure that they're, um, you know, certified um, clean material. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe Bob could talk about the regulatory side of that. The CDFA does administer what we call a registration certification program. However, it's a voluntary program for nurseries to join, and we've worked over the last four years with nurseries because of the surge in red red blotch mm -hmm. and infected uh, plants going out. Um, Keep in mind, until 2012, we did not have the diagnostics to indicate a vine was affected by red blotch. Uh, so it's only since then we've been able to get out there and help the nurseries involved. And keep in mind also that they're producing these plants outdoors, so they're also subject to vectors and other issues. Um, 
but again, it's a it's a voluntary service. It's funded by the industry, uh, the the grower industry as well as the nursery industry, and it requires visual inspection of these certified blocks. However, there's a huge market for non-certified vines as well, uh, both here in the state and outside the state. So there are vines being planted that are not registered and certified. Okay, thank you. Okay, last question uh, if, uh, for you, uh, Mr. Testa, and then and then perhaps uh, uh, Mr. Haig might want to uh, move on this just quickly. I, I, I heard what you said about uh, in the on the Central Coast, very little uh, surface water, uh, mostly uh, groundwater. Uh, is is there an impediment to uh, providing? Um, surface water supplies in in the foothills and everything in terms of you know dams and those type of things for you that uh, uh, would be helpful if we understood what was going on there maybe a you know, like storage ponds for example I, I don't understand why there's not off stream uh, you know ponds or is it, or is that something that you guys have looked at uh, so um a couple things. So you know, the rainfall that we get here is only yeah. last few years have been six to seven inches. And so in, in Napa, when I was farming, it was 40 inches. And so you can rely on that rainwater to fill up reservoirs. Um, and so the rainfall and the amount of runoff that we would be able to capture would be uh, dramatically less. Okay. Um, that being said, there are other issues that we have in terms of um, damming up water. Um, that's a federal, um, uh, very contentious issue uh, interfering with any waterway. Um, and so that's, that's something that we, and logistically, just in general, um, we, you, our reservoir ponds are, are lined in order to be, because we are so penny wise with our water, um, and so you cannot clean out a reservoir that, that is lined in with plastic uh, if you're collecting rainwater, there's going to be sediment that goes in there. So there's logistical challenges, too, as well. All right, thanks. Yeah, yeah just I'm waiting for Lake Kachuma to fill so we can recharge our groundwater as well. I mean, it's, it's sort of just sort of waiting for nature to do its, its business. And uh, interestingly, just uh, from a historical perspective, I'll close by saying that the areas where Vitus vinifera first developed and um, became perfected, uh, requires about, uh, had about 35 inches of annual rainfall. So 30 inches is about, to me, the line, 25 inches maybe, where you can dry farm. And if we could dry farm a year in Santa Barbara, I think we'd be pretty stoked. Yeah. Very good. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your thank time. You. Thank you for being here uh, with us today. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, very much. Uh, we'd like to now open it up for public comment, invite individuals to please come forward if you'd like to be able to uh, say your piece today. We welcome you. If you want to come up to this mic, um, anyone under public comment? Not all at once. Okay. Please, Ms. Comfort. Coming from the great county of Sonoma, we welcome you. I'm Honor Comfort. I'm with the Wine Business Institute at Sonoma State University. And uh, first I wanted to thank the chairs and um, members of this committee for giving us all an opportunity to come to one of the more beautiful corners of our great Golden State. Thank you. Um, I wanted to take a quick moment to just update you on the, the study that was referenced, actually Tim Schmelzer with the Wine Institute referenced the uh, impact assessment that we're conducting at Sonoma State University on uh, the impacts of the wildfires on the wine industry. And um, this study was precipitated actually during the fires when we quickly recognized that there was a need for getting accurate information about the impacts on the industry out into the community and into the media. We were seeing, um, partly due to the, the nature of the fires and the situation, that it was difficult to get accurate information, but also just the speculation and forecasting that was going on, and we were already anticipating the impact that that misinformation alone could have on our industry. And we're currently living through that. Um, again, Tim mentioned that um, when there was some conversation, certainly the focus on the wine industry being open for business. Um, the team at the Wine Business Institute, however, recognized that we had the opportunity to fill this unique role, drawing on the resources that we have, the position to be able to work across 
um, the industry and partnering with the uh, leading regional associations and significantly to focus not just on a single region but literally all four regions together. So the study will focus on Mendocino, Lake, Napa and Sonoma counties looking at that region entirely and the short, mid and long term impacts. But most importantly, using this assessment to pivot and focus on what we can be doing to revitalize and build for recovery um, as we go forward. And we're looking at several different areas, um, including things such as the potential for a policy platform focusing on vineyard development and the benefit of the vineyards around uh, serving as fire breaks. Also, um, the opportunities, as I think there was also a comment about the potential, always needing to find the silver linings in situations like this, um, but creating, using this as an opportunity to build regional plans for preparation within the wine industry specifically. Um, working across regions and creating a system for emergency preparedness and disaster management that we hope and expect can become a model for other wine regions, not only in California, but potentially around the world. We also see an opportunity uh, 30 to seconds, Ms. Comfort, I apologize. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're no good, worries. you're good. Good. Um, and just two last points. Please. One, um, I just want to um, uh, focus that we will be creating a plan for communication and education around the 2017 harvest. We see this as a major um, risk out there for the industry as a whole, making certain that we communicate effectively in advance with trade consumers and the media around um, the, the quality of the wines coming out of 2017 and making certain that's coming from first and foremost a scientific basis, but then also the opportunity for qualitative and quantitative evaluation. Um, and then also we know that there will be opportunities for advancing our industry and our business by finding um, uh, opportunities to build around sustainability, um, collaborating across our regions, and really finding those, those key nuggets for business innovation that we know come out of these situations. So all of this we're looking to put together, um, working across our team. We expect to see preliminary results in early 2018, and we look forward to sharing those with you, but most importantly, the plans for moving ahead as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for making uh, the trek down uh, and for all of your work. And I think that as we've talked about uh, hosting a follow-up to all issues in regards to the fires, I think it would be great to be able to present that uh, to the committee. So thank maybe you. a good We'd idea. We'll work with the chairs on that. We'd be honored to have that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'd like to be able to see if anyone else would like to come up and speak. Please welcome back. You have two minutes. Margie Lindquist again from, is that on? Yeah, you you're good. Okay. Um, with the NRCS here talking about fire and post-fire uh, recovery. Um, also, I really appreciated hearing uh, you uh, bring up the soil health um, initiative. And I think that's uh, a wonderful thing that the state of California has done is to fund the soil health initiative. And um, our partners, the resource conservation districts, are positioned very well to move um, an initiative like that forward. And when we talk about, I really appreciated what you had to say as well. I think we, I've heard that we know more about outer space than we know about the soil beneath our feet, about what's really going on there. And there's so much um, in this soil health and uh, soil microbiology and the <coughs> diversity of it and the benefits of it from making plants more um, resilient to disease, to uh, increasing water holding capacity of, of the soil. So those are all huge issues for, for our, our wine grape industry and all of us. So thank you for, for, for bringing that up. Thanks. Thank you so much. Anyone else who would like to be able to speak, please come forward. If you can just please state your first name. Okay, we're going to bring it back to committee for closing comments uh, in a few thank yous. I'm going to turn it over to Chairwoman Cecilia Aguiar-Curry. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for uh, attending today. Um, I got a lot of little tidbits here that's going to be very helpful as we go forward. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of you for attending today. It um, uh, makes me feel really good. I'm the ag girl. Up there, up, and everybody knows that Cecilia fights for the farmers and she fights for the rural communities. And so it's really nice to have some of my Southern California people particularly uh, come up and understand and learn a little bit about what we deal with in the agriculture community. So thank you very much for attending. 
Thank you, Senators and uh, Assembly mem uh, woman. Um, so if you'd like to s have a closing remark, anybody have anything to say? Thank you, Thank you for coming to God's country. Um, very helpful. Thank you for putting this together. We will be continuing this discussion about um, what we've learned from this event, what we can do to improve, both in terms of the wine industry and the state, uh, you know, lessons learned from tragedies turn us, turn into opportunities. And I want to thank you all and the others who, who have been here uh, to, uh, to testify and look forward to further discussions. And lastly, I'd like to thank our state staff. There's uh, quite a few that attended and came down here and put this together for us, and as well as um, our, um, uh, I forgot his name over there, but anyway, uh, I just want to thank everybody for attending today. Media. Yeah, I uh, I appreciate all the, uh, the speakers that we had today. I think it was just a great conversation. On the first part, I think we could have another forum, uh, you know, in our state uh, select committees on on wine, kind of trying to address the issue about uh, growing grapes in the hillsides. There's a lot of conversations locally. And let me tell you, the vintners are and uh, are, are not coming. The ag people are not coming out uh, very well in that discussion. We all know there has to be sustainability. We all know that we have municipal watersheds in, in a lot of those areas that have to be maintained and managed. But we also have to remember that our growers are the most regulated agriculture, uh, not only in the state. Uh, but also in the country. And frankly, I've got a lot of experience because I was a past chair of the uh, great wine capitals of the world. And as we surveyed those great wine capitals around the world, they're not doing anywhere near what we're doing to protect our hillsides, to prevent runoff. And in many, many cases, most of the, the growers are uh, as smart about that because they don't want their topsoil down below. I've been in Europe where they've you know, planted on slopes twice as much as what we plant here. I think because of these fires, it's going to be something, uh, and I saw it from the air and I heard about it today from uh, Chief, uh, about these vineyards, you know, making some incredible fire breaks uh, and also how they save so many, so many houses. So I think there's gotta be a more expansive discussion about how we go further and how we define sustainability in our watersheds. No, I, 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 thank, I thank you all for coming to the district. This is actually also UCSB for hosting. I spent 11 years here before I was up in the state legislature. Um, and I also appreciate the, the conversation in relation to research. Um, I think a, a future conversation too is how we communicate the research to the general public. Because I have to tell you, 11 years of doing research here at UCSB, that's actually a very hard thing to do. Um, and, and in all of these conversations, the public weighs in in different ways to all of us. They call us. And I think that that's something um, that's uh, a difficult uh, thing to do, but I think a very much important thing to do in light of the many aspects that the public is impacted by in terms of the conversations we've had today. So thank you all for your expertise and for bringing this. And again, to um, our, our leaders um, in this conversation, thank you for allowing Santa Barbara uh, to host you. No, thank you. And it is our first time and it won't be our last for sure. So yes. Yes. absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Jackson hosted us for a uh, wonderful breakfast this morning. So thank you very much. Uh, again, big thank you to UCSB. Very grateful for your hospitality. Um, and as the chairwoman said, Special thank you to the teams from Senator Dodd and Assemblyman Aguirre Curry's office, to Carlene, Kim, and Lyles. Thank you so much to our sergeants, to our uh, media services team. We're grateful, and we look forward to having you all back. I think we're going to be up in either uh, the, somewhere in the North Bay, first part of 2018, to our panelists. Thank you so much. This committee hearing is adjourned. <laughs>